and then we'll uh, establish that we can have this meeting electronically. Uh, as I call each member's name, if you had uh, announced that you're present uh, to establish a quorum, I'd appreciate that. And we'll start with Ms. Davis. Present. Uh, Ms. Parker. Present. Mr. Newton. Present. Mr. Pepper. Uh, Mr. Pepper. All right, uh, Mr. Lawless. I'm here. All right, and, then, and it looks like Mr. Pepper has uh, logged in, but is on mute. So uh, we have uh, David Taylor here and, and present. Uh, Mr. Pepper. I'm here. Sorry, right. I had it on mute. Yep. <laughs> All right. You're, you probably were to let us know you were present over and over and over. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Having established that the quorum is present, the Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of May 21st, 2020. My name is Emily Lamb, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearing. We are convened electronically pursuant to Governor Lee's Executive Orders number 16 and 34 in order to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and still conduct essential business of the Metropolitan Government. Before we move on with the meeting, the governor's executive orders require a motion to proceed electronically. Mr. Chairman, staff would solicit a motion related to that effect. Make a motion, Tom Lawless. Mr. Lawless has made a motion. I'll second that motion, and unless there's any discussion, uh, we will take a vote. Seeing none, we'll start with Mr. Lawless. Um, Mr. Pepper. Uh, for the for it. Uh, Mr. Newton. Aye. Ms. Davis? In favor. And Ms. Carpenter? Uh, in favor. And I vote in favor also that uh, motion passes. We will have an electronic meeting today. In order to convene this meeting pursuant to those executive orders, board members are participating remotely, and we encourage members of the public to submit comments in support or opposition to the board electronically at bza at nashville.gov. We extended the deadline to submit comments, and any comments received by 12 noon yesterday, Wednesday, May 20th, were provided to the board for consideration prior to the hearing. Any comments received after 12 noon yesterday will be read into the record. I'm here at the Sunny West Conference Room at a station that has been set up for anyone who wishes to address the board. Social distance measures have been implemented. We've got some hand sanitizer up at the podium. We've also opened the back room, so I would encourage any of y'all who are up in the front of the room, there is plenty of space in the back of the room now so that you can further spread out to um, sufficiently socially distance. For these board hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearing. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, if anyone is here wishing to speak in support of the appeal, they may do so. If any opposition is present, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide re rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of that originally allotted 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate telephonically and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 1740-180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire zoning code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for the Metro Nashville network and because the board is hearing these cases telephonically, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come to the front podium here at the Sunny West Conference Room and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make the desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. 
In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of the BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals. Several. Case 2019-109 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2019, I'm sorry, 2020-119 has been deferred to June 4th. Also, that first one, I believe, should be 2020-109. Um, June 4th. Case 2020-119 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2020-055 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2020-065 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2020-069 has been deferred to June 4th. And, the, and these are all on the short-term docket now, right? Uh, the last three that I've read have been, yes. Okay. The first two were the zoning cases and the last, starting with 055 have been the short-term rental cases. Great, thank you. So that's 055, 065, 069, and then 2020-078 has been deferred to June 4th. Case 2020-090 has been deferred to June 18th. 2020-094 has been deferred to June 18th. 2020-095 has been deferred to June 18th. 2020-098 has been deferred to June 18th. 2020-107 has been deferred to June 18th. For members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. The consent agenda for today's meeting was published on May 15th and May 20th, 2020, so anyone wishing to pull an item from consent could do so electronically. We did not receive any cases, or I'm sorry, any requests to pull anything from the previously published consent agenda. However, as previously stated, we are here at the station set up at the Sunny West Conference Room for anyone wishing to appear in person to pull an item from the consent agenda. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of these cases, we'll remove the case from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. First case, 2019-300, involving property at 900 18th Avenue South. This is a request for a special exception to allow additional height within the Build 2 zone to construct an office building. The applicant has agreed to planning's recommendation Prior to the issuance of building permits, they will work with the planning department to better integrate the parking garage screening into the building design and streetscape elements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-300? Next, case 2020-128 involving property at 106 Lewis Street. This is a setback variance request to construct a single family residence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2020-128? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, to review the cases on consent agenda are case 2019-300, and I'm sorry, I keep saying 2019. No, that is 2019. <laughs> sorry. Uh, 2019-300 and 2020-128. We would solicit a vote from the board at this time. Okay, uh, there's a motion uh, for the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second, Ross Pepper. Uh, second by Mr. Pepper. Um, any discussion? If you know, yeah, and, and if there's any discussion, any time of that, just hit your hit the raise hand button, and I'll I'll call on you. Um, seeing none, then I'll do a roll call vote, and I will start uh, at the top of the list with Ms. Ernest. 
vote in favor. Ms. Carpenter? In favor. Mr. Logan? I'm sorry, Mr. Newton? <laughs> in favor. I haven't been here long enough for me to get that. <laughs> right. Sorry about that. All right. That's all right. All right. Mr. Pepper? In favor. And Mr. Lawless? In favor. I'll vote in favor also, then that motion passes. Normally when we're all together, at, uh, it, we're more on a first name basis, but that it seems like this is a much more formal setting with this electronic thing. So uh, I'm good with first names. Everybody of, of their formal names. Uh, anyway, uh, that motion passes and we can uh, start our, our meeting. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, Please give our staff until Monday to process all the documentation associated with your appeal. At which I'm sorry, not Monday, Monday's a holiday, Tuesday. Give us until Tuesday to process the documentation, at which point you can come in to pursue the permits for which you have applied. Mr. Chairman, before we move on for the cases to be heard, we would like to take this opportunity to recognize any elected officials who are in attendance. Council Lady Murphy is here. Would you like to address the board now? Yes. Council Lady Mercy has opted to speak when the case is called. I don't see any other council members here, although masks make it difficult. So if there are any, please let me know. All right. Um, absent any other announcements, then, Mr. Chairman, we're ready to proceed with the cases to be heard. Great. Okay, first case to be considered is case 2020-061. This is a parking variance request to construct this hotel. There are, the code requires 139 spaces and the applicant is requesting 90 spaces. Uh, before you now is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is ORI. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is a site plan that was submitted by the applicant and finally the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 61? Mr. Chairman, there's no one here in opposition um, to case 61. There was um, there were some letters and emails of opposition that were sent into the board for your consideration, but no one is here in person. So given that no one is here in person, I believe it would be appropriate for there to be five minutes for the applicant to address the board. Okay. You can come up to the board, come up to the podium. Uh, my name is Joe Brady. My address is 3724 Burris Street. Um, I'd like to first request that we um, allow 10 minutes for additional rebuttal when there's any. There's nobody here in opposition, so you'll just have five minutes. Are we able to um, have 10 minutes regardless? To present? Not unless there's opposition present. Okay. Um, Right, well, I'm with Southeast. Oh, well, I say that the board can vote to give you additional time, but the rules dictate that you get five minutes if opposition is not present. So if you would like additional time, you'll need to make that request to the board and let them vote on it. And make a request to the board to fill out for 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman, can you all hear this gentleman speaking? It's a, it's a little bit difficult, but we can. Um, and, you know, again, questions don't count against your time. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't really have a, an, uh, you know, this is a big case, has an awful lot of uh, pieces that we're going to talk about in terms of, that are that are part of our record. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't have an objection, uh, but I also think that, you know, if you just wanted to go ahead and make your case and we ask questions, you'll have more than ample time to make your case. And if you don't, then we can certainly offer you more time at, at, that, at that time too. Um, okay, well, we do have three presenters. Um, with us. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll then I'll, I'll, then, okay. Yeah. Just let, let's just get started, and then uh, we, we can we can play that. We we I don't uh, recall us ever uh, denying an applicant extra time uh, when it was needed uh, again within reason. And so uh, let's just get started and, and just see where we are as we go. Okay. Um, again, my name is Bo Brady. Um, I'm with Southeast Venture along with Paul Plummer with Southeast Venture representing JV Hospitality Group for this proposed hotel. Um, we're here requesting a reduction of on-site parking required by Metro's parking standards from 137 required spaces to 90 spaces. Um, these 90 spaces will be 100% valet parked and screened completely from the street on the two main frontages and a two-level parking garage. 
um, presenting alongside Southeast Central, we'll have Beth Ostrowski with KCI, who's our parking and traffic engineer, as well as our valley parking operator, Owen Stanford, who's VP of Premier Parking. Um, first, we'd like to say that this um, proposed 168 key hotel was designed um, with the intent of meeting all the zoning requirements. It is in direct compliance um, with the Midtown, or I guess the guidelines of the Midtown Neighborhood Study and is in full compliance with ORI based zoning, which has um, been placed on this property for over 20 years when it was first enacted in 1998 by council. Um, the hotel meets all um, street setbacks and um, sky plane requirements without exception. So we're, we're really here to ask the board to consider a reasonable reduction to the on-site um, parking requirements based on best practices and design standards, which have evolved significantly um, due to ride share um, patterns experienced by the hotel industry. Um, another thing we wanted to address is that this hotel is not in any way um, diminishing the, the value of the core stored nature of some of these commercial buildings along Ellison Place. Um, we're actually part of, we're, this new hotel is part of three different projects that are redeveloping to try and revitalize the Rock Block neighborhood. Um, it's located on the south side of Ellison, along with the restoration of the soda shop, the revitalization of the original Gold Rush buildings, which are being taken on by Tony Giratano with his Rock Block Flats project. So overall, um, we're trying to allow this redevelopment to provide economic benefit to uh, not only the existing but future businesses of the Rock Block neighborhood. Um, I would like to ask Beth to come up to um, present to the board um, her report to help um, support this request followed by Owen, who will share some market data on the surrounding um, neighborhood lots. Hi, my name is Beth Ostrowski, 5539 Knob Road. I'm a professional engineer <clears throat> in the state of Tennessee, specializing in traffic. We have analyzed the required parking for this development um, with the following results. Um, 168 key hotel with approximately 25 employees under UZO guidelines requires 132 spaces when taking the allowable reductions up to 25%. As I've discussed here previously, and Owen will expand on in just a minute, um, the introduction of rideshare has led to a significant shift in hotel parking demand and code, and the code is written today and published today as out of date, really, for hotels. Data shows that hotels in the urban core have as few as 25% of guests arriving by personal vehicle, um, therefore requiring a parking space. Um, in a suburban setting, we see the reverse of that with approximately 75% of hotel guests arriving by personal vehicle. In the Midtown neighborhood, I would anticipate a projected split of personal vehicle versus rideshare of approximately 50-50. Um, therefore, my recommendation is a 50% reduction to the required parking. However, my client has submitted their request um, to the BZA for only a 35% reduction, um, ultimately providing 96. I'll hand it over to Owen. I, I do have a question for you uh, because you had, you had mentioned that this is David Taylor, uh, board chair, that you had mentioned that there was already a 25% reduction for urban settings and while it's- so, Yeah, I've heard the standard use your reductions for transit, pedestrian access, and contextual front setbacks. Right, so I mean, if they're already getting a 25% and you're saying they should get another 50%, that's really more than, your recommendation is actually more than 50%, then you, you could consider that that way, although I think that the um, UZO reductions, well, well, you know, specifically transit and pedestrian access could provide um, a reduction, a true reduction in parking. Contextual front setback isn't really associated with how many people will actually park. Um, so that reduction is, is in, in some ways arbitrary. But yes, you're, you're correct that if you take 25 plus the 35 they're requesting, that's over 50. Okay, thank you. Hi, 
Uh, and Mr. Chairman, before the next speaker talks, I would just let you know there are 39 seconds left on the clock. So for your purposes in determining whether or not you want to extend the time for her to speak, um, rather than interrupting her, I would just, and we will if the time runs out, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. Is Mr. Pepper, you had your hand up? Is Mr. Trevor? Uh, no. Well, I, I would, I would, uh, you, I'm sorry. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not catch the last speaker's name. Was there a parking study submitted with our packet? I did not see one. I may have missed it. There was a lot in this, in this particular case packet. We submitted um, a traffic impact study that included a parking section. Okay. All right, thank you. And does, does any board member have any objection to uh, add, adding three more minutes to the time for this last speaker? Mr. Wallace? I'm not real sure we need to add additional time, Mr. Chairman. Any other thoughts? All right, then let's just see where we are in, in their 45 seconds. Okay, my name's Owen Sanford, 1328 Westville Drive. Um, so really just providing some data points specific to the neighborhood and parking occupancy surrounding the hotel. Uh, my company, Premier Parking, operates um, around 900 spaces within a three block radius of the proposed hotel. Um, and over the year of 2019, those 900 approximate spaces never reached 60% occupancy during the year, meaning that at peak usage time, we never reached full occupancy or uh, really very close. Um, and then based on the parking demand of hotels in the area and in the specific submarket of the city, we created a parking demand model. Um, and so what that means is if the hotel is 100% occupied, and 36% of the people that drive to the hotel decide to park their car. Um, at peak, we would only ever park 60 cars for the hotel. And I apologize for the interruption, but because they're not here to see the clock, Mr. Chairman, the time is up. Okay. Um, well, I, I really would like to hear more about the, the parking study because it really is the only uh, um, the only basis that that I can think of where we have uh, considered this type of variant. So I will I'll just ask the question if you could help me understand the um, yeah help me understand the rest of, of your uh, your analysis. Yes, are you asking specifically related to the drive-in ratio that I was just discussing? Yeah, yeah just finish finish that thought for me, please. Yeah, absolutely. So we prepared two models. One was based on the hotel being 100% occupied. Uh, so every room in the hotel sold. Um, and our assumption based on the average drive-in ratio, so the number of people driving their car and parking it on site, um, we based that on several hotels that are in this submarket and what their actual rates were in 2019. Um, and the average is 36%, um, which is actually a little bit lower than what Beth had mentioned. Um, which means that we would park with a fully occupied hotel, no more than 60 cars at peak. Based on the average hotel occupancy in 2019, which was 75%, if we applied that same drive-in ratio, we would only park 45 cars at any one given time. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. I'm not sure who had their hand up first, but I'll start with Mr. Lawless. Long button hand. I don't have a question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, Mr. Neal. Uh, yes. Uh, so my question would be: What is the uh, typical drive uh, drive-in or whatever rate for uh, for this brand of for a Holiday Inn Express? What's what's the average uh, drive-in rate on that? Brand specific drive-in ratios are not typically tracked because it's so very heavily dependent on the market that you're in. So the drivability of the city is really important to note. 
um, and then what particular kind of sub neighborhood you're in. Um, so, but typically, um, this brand of hotel has a little bit higher drive-in rate, um, just given cost point and a lot of different factors. Um, but given that it's not in the downtown core, we see far less ride sharing happening. And so it goes up a little bit to, to that 36%. So just for some perspective, the average drive in ratio for Nashville as a whole, um, not just this neighborhood is in the 20 to 25% range. Um, so you can see kind of the, the difference there. So um, it's still a very low drive in rate, um, all things considered, uh, counting how many cars that is. Um, but, but I would say more the location affects the driving rate more than the brand of hotel. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Tarbeck. I called on you twice, but I wasn't. Uh, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> I understand. Uh, my question is: um, I think I heard you state your hardship as um, the code is outdated in terms of um, the parking counts. Is there any other hardship you um, you could tell us about? My name is Paul Plummer. I'm a Southeast Venture Principal. I'm at 4024 Crestbridge Drive, Nashville. Um, I believe that the hardship here is one that we speak about when we're dealing with the ordinances of the city of Nashville and you're in the hotel business. So all of the hotels within the downtown core are required to provide zero parking. This is in the Midtown area where the zoning is based on the 1970s and uh, I think that the hardship is the board has to make decisions on individual projects. And this is really to be part of a new ordinance just for the parking requirement with ride sharing. Um, I think there's a lot of waste when you build an entire floor of parking and it's unutilized for a period of 20 years and is maintained other than the natural resources that are wasted. Uh, these would be abandoned spaces. So at 90 spaces, which we're providing on two parking levels, a third level would be required and it would not be utilized and is not commercially viable. Um, the hardship is that the ordinance doesn't address it. It is a moving target and the numbers are going down, not up. When we provide 90 spaces, we're 50% more than the consultants, both consultants recommend a 60. And then uh, one of our consultants, Owen, is with Premier who will be operating the facility. They've shown an operating facility diagram. They also have the ability to peak, uh, have peak parking up to 106. So we believe that we have a very viable parking plan. We shouldn't have to do more than that. And while there has been some opposition predominantly because the buildings are desirable for those who would like to preserve. Uh, the historic uh, overlay was looked at in the 2012 plan and update for Midtown. And it was virtually unanimous that the property owners were opposed to an overlay of historic nature. So we believe that this is part of the historic rock clock coming back because it's a commercial venture. It will bring 137 hotel rooms and uh, additional commercial to the vitality of the of the original rock lot. But we believe we're still over park and it's the burden of having to come to this board to sort of take for less when we really believe the ordinance should attack it to a text amendment. Maybe that could be done in the next year or so. Uh, Mr. Pepper? Uh, yes. and. Uh, excuse me if this question is a result of me not being able to find something, but this this packet for this case was was really big. Um, and y'all talked about some data you have on parking and some comparable parking. Can you give me a date on a letter or where where that is, was submitted with your written materials? There were two supplemental documents that were provided by the noon deadline that Emily has put in your package. She would have to give reference to those. One was- Mr. Pepper, any of the documents that we received 
as the board knows, we sent the initial doc, uh, board packet on Friday. And the updated packet that I sent yesterday, any documents that were submitted after Friday were in the back of the case file. So you'll, what was submitted yesterday will so be at the back of that. One of them is a one-page letter from KCI, which Beth Ostrowski represents that firm. Can speak to that one-page letter again. It shows their chart, their recommendation. KCI is RPM Industries. They've been before this board over the last 20 years consistently addressing parking and that they, they they have a very trustworthy method. They use the national standards. Um, Owen, who is with Premier, is really representing the operator and tells you what's going on in Nashville, Tennessee, based on the trends of utilization because they operate for four or five, well, multiple hotels throughout Nashville. And so we saw them as two resources. Each of them have given you a document that was in the supplement. They can come up and in one minute give a synopsis of that document. But again, it's one page from the KCI parking study, which is a synopsis for you. And the other is about a two-page diagram from Premier. And they can speak to each of those as you find the time to find those in your packet. Uh, that, that's not necessary. I just wanted to make sure I could find them. And I just I just found them. They were at the end of the packet. And um, okay. Thanks for your patience on that, but there were about, I th there were just tons of emails submitted with this packet, so I found them, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Newton? Yes, um, I guess my, my question, I, in some of those many, many emails that we, and, and letters that we got, uh, I noticed that several of them noted, uh, you know, the more budget nature of a Holiday Inn Express and that, you know, uh, some of uh, many of the uh, people arriving there would uh, would would be parking cars and, and things like that. But you know, what if they don't want to pay for your valet services since you said you're valet only? Since most Holiday Inn Expresses have a you know a free parking kind of feature to them, uh, how 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 would the um, you know propensity to go park across the street at the church or? Uh, or take away the parking on the street from the neighborhood be addressed by the hotel? Yep. Well, we worked with several hotels to manage the cost within parameters that are allowed by the Holiday Inn Express. And then they manage those in terms of making sure that people understand that it's mandatory to park the car through the valet service, and that can be done through their management. Um, Jay Patel is here if he wants to answer any more specific questions about that operation. But I will say the Holiday Inn Express is part of one of the largest networks of multiple hotels. And it's a very points driven, very business model. Uh, it's for frequent travelers that tend to be using those and they are next to the largest employment markets of Nashville with a block from Vanderbilt and then all the St. Thomas and hospital forward. So we're gonna find that there is a group of people that are paying or it's not necessarily a summer vacation budget and we're driving there and even that's changing as you know. So uh, Jay might want to speak to the call of, the, of that service. And uh, Mr. Chairman, while he's walking up here, I will just let y'all know if you have, while well, after your questions for the applicant, there, Robin Ziegler from the Historic Commission is on this WebEx event. So if you have, if anyone has any questions for historic, um, based on their recommendation or just would like them to weigh in, she is here and available if you have questions. You don't have to ask her questions, but she's here if you would like to. Great, thank you. And Sure, uh, Jay Patel, um, one of the uh, owners of this uh, new proposed development. And for as far as Holiday and Express goes, uh, uh, your urban Holiday and Expresses typically do have a parking charge. Um, you know, the parking, uh, charge for this particular hotel is not going to be what's towards downtown the core. Uh, we're expecting anywhere from 12 to $15 a night. Very reasonable. Um, but typical Holiday Express that are located in your uh, downtown um, a high density area usually have uh, parking costs. Even, uh, even a self park Holiday Inn Expresses have a parking cost. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do have, uh, I know that the uh, district council member, Brandon Taylor, uh, has written a letter opposing um, this request. And we did have a, a letter from Councilman 
uh, Jeff Syracuse also asking us to oppose this. And the Metro Historical Commission, um, actually it was Tim Walker that wrote the letter asking us uh, to oppose this request, um, predominantly because of the, uh, he, he, he thought it would set a precedent for um, encouraging other historic buildings to be uh, torn down. And so since uh, Robin Ziegler is here, I would I would ask if, uh, if she wouldn't mind just uh, discussing uh, the letter that um, Tim Walker sent and the position of the Historic Commission. Sure, thank you. This is Robin. Um, yeah, our thought was that whenever you are giving something away, you know, not following through with the requirement uh, that the city needs typically, then there should be some sort of community benefit. And to our minds that this will encourage and require demolition. And our hope is that at least some of this property could be saved. It's three different historic buildings eligible for listing in the National Register and probably could work really well as a hotel or as part of a, a newer building as part of the hotel. So I think the use is great, but we're just concerned that allowing for this will ensure that the buildings will be demolished. But was there any uh, conversation or uh, about that that is a possibility with the uh, ownership team and? Yes, yeah. we do. We okay. do. And it, was there any? Uh, was there at any point in this process a thought that hey something might happen or is it was it just hey this isn't their plan and you know they have different ideas for the property for you know another kind of generation of use so to speak yeah the last conversation i had with them was that they would look into it and then we saw this filing with with you okay any other any questions uh for Ms. ziegler mr pepper uh, yes, Ms. Sigler, thank you for being here. Uh, is there is there any kind of separate historic protection for these buildings? There is no protection for them. Uh, the only protection, the only thing that can prevent demolition is being in an overlay, and there is not an overlay in this area. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Mr. Lawless. Not a question, more of a, are we gonna close the public comment portion of the meeting, Mr. Chairman? Uh, well, we're in, the, we're in the stage right now for board members to ask questions of any of the participants. Uh, and when that, uh, when I stop seeing hands and questions stop, then, then we will gladly close that public hearing. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a final call for questions for the applicant. All right, seeing none, uh, then the applicant, I believe, was uh, out of time, so I will close the public hearing. Um, and, and of course, if there comes a need during our, our discussion to ask a question, we can reopen that public hearing at the um, vote of the board. And so at this point, I will ask uh, board members for uh, any thoughts that they have. Ms. Davis. So from my perspective and reviewing the packet and listening to the testimony of the applicant, I'm having a hard time seeing a hardship here. Um, I don't, I'm still listening, so I'm willing to listen to the perspective of my fellow board members. But at this point, um, I'm finding a hard time supporting this in light of the fact that a reduction's already been given in light of where this building is. And the assumptions in which the parking study were based, I don't necessarily find those reliable. So at this point, without more evidence of a hardship, I, I'm, I'm sort of in a hard place to support this. I tend, I'm sorry, I tend to agree with, um, with Tim Walker in, from Historic that you know, the hardship I think is it's a little tough to see, but also would be much more willing to uh, support even a fairly dramatic hardship uh, if it if, if the gain to the city and gain to the neighborhood was some type of of preservation. Um, 
you know, th that to me would warrant a hardship is, you know, like a mature tree or a, you know, in this case, a mature building uh, that you're trying to say. Uh, Ms. Karpenick? Uh, I agree with both of you. Just wanted to add my, my thought there. Mr. Lawless? I'm having a difficult time to finding a hardship that's not self-imposed and I, I support the comments of Ms. Davis and Ms. Kerfenek, actually. Um, Mr. Newton? Yeah, just I, I agree with everything that's been said by the, the uh, three other board, four other board members so far, so. And Ms. Kerfenek? Well, my turn to apologize. I left the hand up by accident. <laughs> We'll get the hang of it one day. Okay. Mr. Pepper. Uh, I would, I, I will move that we deny the application. Mr. Lawless. I'll second the motion. Uh, there's a motion, there's a second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Then uh, we'll take a vote, Mr. Pepper. Uh, in favor of the motion. Mr. Lawless? In favor of the motion. Ms. Davis? In favor of the motion. Ms. Carpenter? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Uh, I'll vote in favor also. That motion passes. Next case. Next case for the board to consider is case 2020-071 involving property at 411 Ackland Park Drive. This is a request for a variance from sidewalk requirements to construct a single family residence without building sidewalks or paying into the sidewalk fund. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is R6. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant is before you now. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 071? There is, uh, the council member here is here in opposition to this case. So Mr. Collins, you'll have 10 minutes and the council member will have 10 minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you, members of the board. I believe my amended appeal, I just wanted to make sure we had submitted an amended appeal and I wanted to make sure that all the board members had gotten that amended appeal and it's titled as such in the packet. So I wanted to make sure that those are the ones that you're looking at. The argument is relatively straightforward. Mr. Knight purchased this property, and then upon getting the site plan figured out and getting everything submitted, a site plan came out and they found out that the amount of impervious, if, if required to create a sidewalk or if required to build a sidewalk, it would create a 3% roughly increase in the amount of impervious um, areas and square footage, and that in conversations that the builder had with public works, that that would create pooling or water and or an area that would create flooding to the neighboring um, property owners. In light of such, Mr. Knight made appeal to the zoning administrator in order to waive the requirement for him to pay or to build a sidewalk because public works simply said, we don't want you to build a sidewalk in no uncertain terms. And the zoning administrator said that, or came back, and again, it's important to note that this request was made in October, and in January is finally when Mr. Knight got a response as to whether or not it was approved on this waiver of the requirement. Regardless, Mr. Knight, the zoning administrator said to Mr. Knight that he would have to pay into the sidewalk fund, and as such, Mr. Knight has made that appeal here, saying that the zoning administrator has erred. I think it's very clear, if you look at the Metro Code, section 17.20.120A3, that if there is steep topography or other hardship, the zoning administrator may approve an, an alternative design or eliminate the sidewalk requirement in whole or in part if it is determined that a new sidewalk would not further the goal of extending or completing the sidewalk network, and it goes on and then we've attached a copy of that certified Metro code as exhibit five of this hearing. If you look at exhibit three with me, it'll clearly state that if you look at page three of exhibit three and I'll go to it real quickly.
In the upper right-hand corner, and you'll notice that this page has a 9-12-2018 in the upper right-hand corner. But if you look at the site data, it says pre-development, the amount of impervious area space will be 2,950 square feet or 47.2%. And it does a breakdown of the residence, asphalt, and concrete. Then it goes down to post-development if the sidewalk is completed, and that puts that back to that 50%, which shows that roughly 3% increase. The bottom line is this, Mr. Knight, I think squarely fits within the, within the requirements allowed within the code for this to be a waiver completely of the requirement. And Mr. Knight shouldn't be required to pay into the fund when it makes no sense whatsoever. In fact, Public Works has said, please don't build this sidewalk. And so Mr. Knight shouldn't be able, shouldn't have to then pay into the fund if the ability for him to build a sidewalk is simply not there, and we've made the argument that that would, a requirement to do so would constitute a taking. Very simply, and I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal, but very simply, Mr. Knight shouldn't be required to pay into the funds due to the topography and the sheer landscape that he's building his house on. And finally, I will say this though, it is important to note that he's not increasing the density, he's just building a bigger house, the house is already there. So there's no, he's not adding or taking away to the current zoning or building or what's being used in that property. Thank so, uh, Mr. Collins, you, you had said that he uh, was willing to build the sidewalk, but Public Works doesn't want him to be. Do you know, is, is is part of the issue here the difference in cost of him building it versus the Luffy? Right, so obviously it'd be cheaper for him to build it. And, and I'll, I'll be very clear, we've got the affidavit of Mr. Stephen Hagen. It wasn't a definitive no from Public Works not to build the sidewalk. I don't want to mislead the board into thinking that they said you can't build one. Public Works just intimated to him that if you build one, it's gonna cause flooding to this area and to the areas surrounding. So it was is, is implicit, that, at least from the builder's perspective, that don't build it. Okay. All right, and um, I guess it, I'll have a, I guess a question back to um, Ms. Lamb and anybody from Codes. Is there any documentation that we have that has been submitted on behalf of Codes or Public wor Works or Stormwater or whoever does that for us? Mr. Chair, I don't have anything that's in your board packet because we received it after the noon deadline yesterday. I do have two emails to read into the record. One is from Steve Mishu at Stormwater, and he said, Emily, Metro Water and Sewer can and does coordinate alternate sidewalk designs with Metro Planning Commission and Metro Public Works as a standard practice. We can work with the applicant on an alternate, alternate design that meets Metro government standards and specifications. And then I have one from Ben York from Public Works and his similarly says, Emily, Metro Public Works can and does coordinate alternate sidewalk designs with Metro Planning Commission and Metro Water and Sewer as a standard practice. We can work with the applicant on an alternate design that meets Metro government standards and specifications. And those, um, as I said, were submitted after the deadline, but as the current practice, I guess, dictates, would be read into the records. So I guess the question to the applicant is, would be, have you, um, Given those comments, is there a reason not to try to work out an alternative design with Public Works? Well, I mean, I, respectfully, I'm, I'm hearing this for the first time, as I guess you all as the board are. And again, we've been trying to work with Public Works since October. They've been aware of this situation, and there's been no alternative plan mentioned, despite the attempts to work with them. So I. I'm slightly taken aback by the comment because I, that hasn't deemed to be what my understanding of the situation was. So with respect to that, I, I don't know that there would be an alternative sidewalk design, but I, I definitively I can't answer that question because this is the first time I'm hearing any mention of that from public work. Okay. Any, any questions at the app for the applicant now? All right, seeing none, I think you said you wanted to reserve the rest of your time. Did you, did you have anything else to say at this point? No. 
Okay, then we'll reserve the rest of your time for rebuttal and hear from the opposition who I believe is represented by Council Lady Murphy. Thank you, Board Chair. Um, I actually was not planning on speaking on this case today because most of these cases, as you're aware, um, are usually resolved between public works and planning to either pay some amount into the fee or, or create an alternate design. And so I have not followed up on this um, on this case until I was here for another one and saw it come up. Um, my standard letter to y'all typically when uh, waivers are applied for or someone files for a BZA uh, appeal to y'all to not build and not pay at all, I usually ask y'all to, um, to look at it closely and to require them to build it if at all possible. And if it, they're, you know, true hardships to not build it, to have them pay at least something into the in fee because that is only what is fair to, um, I think, all of my constituents. This part of my district is kind of on the edge of my district, um, near 440 as my boundary. And it is where, if you're familiar with the 440 Greenway that opened up about a year and a half ago. And so this is increasingly an area that is becoming, um, wanting to be pedestrian friendly, needing to be pedestrian friendly, because we still have eating in the area. Um, we were able to get a stop sign recently at the, a nearby intersection to here that has slowed down traffic and helped protect uh, pedestrians on the 440 Greenway. But I think a sidewalk connecting through here will be vitally important, um, not only because Murphy Road is nearby and this is a would be a pedestrian cut through from Murphy Road to the 440 Greenway. Um, also, we're getting a sidewalk on 37th that is not far from here. And, um, and again, this would be a great connect, uh, pedestrian connector between the 37th Avenue um, sidewalk, this, you know, a, a sidewalk that potentially could be through here to the Greenway to Sylvan Heights um, because the 37th Avenue uh, sidewalk connects Sylvan Park and Sylvan Heights. So virtually from Charlotte to Murphy Road, there will be a sidewalk. And this is just a little nook that would continue that pedestrian um, alternative ways if you wanted to get off Murphy Road. So at the end of the day, I'm asking that y'all um, either, you know, maybe defer this so the applicant can, if, if he feels he has not had enough time to work with an alternative design, the public works can maybe explore that with the applicant or um, have them build it or, or have them pay uh, the full amount would be my request. Okay. Any, any questions for Council Lady Murphy? Mr. Lawless. Wrong button, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Would this be an appropriate time to perhaps make a motion to defer this? Or um, well, I, we can, we, 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 yeah, we need to hear just, from the applicant who has time for rebuttal and then we can ask the applicant, um, I guess we can ask the applicant questions about it, their willingness to uh, develop an alternative sidewalk plan or not, or have us decide this today. Uh, but I think we need to hear from the applicant what, what their uh, wishes would be and thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to briefly respond to um, Council Lady's re remarks. I, I completely understand the city's desire and need for there to be a public good and there to be sidewalks, but it's important to note that my client, Mr. Knight, didn't create this need. He didn't improve upon it. He didn't add to it. And he is not the one that should have to pay for the public good of a sidewalk. If the city wants to build public infrastructure, then they should be the ones that uh, bear that burden. I think. In line with the Fifth Amendment argument, this would be a con unconstitutional taking of my client's property if he's required to pay and or build, especially given the circumstances that we have before us. Um, with respect to deferral, I would keep in mind that this application was made in October. We didn't get a response until January. It's now May. And my client has had to pay the carry cost on his note this entire time. So respectfully, I would request that um, 
this be decided today. I would just say that, you know, he's only, this is a single family home. He's not making a bigger development. I've made the arguments pretty clearly within the paperwork that you have. And I do believe if he's required to pay or to build in light of the circumstances or at all, quite frankly, that it would be an unconstitutional taking at this point. And I would just respectfully state that, again, Mr. Knight did nothing to increase the foot traffic to increase the amount of people that are going through this, to increase the number of residents or anything like that. This is a single family home being improved upon on what was a single family home. And given the circumstances of the property, the topography of the property, the statements of public works and what's happened with this causing flooding, and until today there being no mention of an alternative plan, I respectfully state that I think this falls squarely within an exception that this board should grant and Mr. Knight shouldn't be required to build or to pay into the fund, and we respectfully request that that be the decision of the board. And I'm available for questions if there are any more. Uh, Mr. Newton. Yes, uh, I guess my question would be, you know, uh, he's obviously uh, looking to enlarge the footprint of the house, and that appears to have what been what's triggered uh, going over the impervious surface area that you mentioned. It, you know, it, how how would that not be a, a hardship in, in, in you know incurred, uh, or how would that may not be a self-imposed hardship at that point? Do you mean just increasing the part of it is also the construction of the concrete drive and the sidewalk? Is what the increase in the amount of impervious is. Right, but to so as I'm looking at it, it looks like you're actually decreasing the amount of concrete dry sidewalk, or I mean concrete and you know a flat surface, and just but you're increasing the, the building area so much that it ends up being a net increase. Is that right? There is a net increase, correct? Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm also curious. I mean, you, you said this thing started in October. But the warrant uh, or the, uh, oh, what do you, the, hang on, I'm sorry. The, uh, the zoning administrator's uh, waiver, not warrant, uh, the waiver, I guess, is dated early March. And so, to me, the actual, you know, from our appeal process, you know, once it goes, it, planning makes a recommendation that they work with the zoning administrator on the waiver request. And once that's made, if you don't like it, you can appeal uh, to us. And so to me, that clock started in March. And so I guess I'm not sure what the process was from October to, to March. Right, so, and I can address that. In October, the building permit was applied for. Then they go through and they do the building, they go through and get, Jack Whitson comes out there and does the land survey and figures out, hey, this is gonna cause pooling and flooding to the other neighbors. Then they get with Metro Codes and Waterworks and they talk about, well, this is where it's gonna lay and this is where the flooding is gonna be. And then in October, they finally said, well, we don't really want you to build it, but this is where we're at. So then in October, from March to October, that all that process was taking place. In October, Mr. Knight made the appeal to the zoning administrator and waited and waited and waited for a response, and we didn't get one until January after I emailed the zoning administrator requesting what the status was. So the delay from October was waiting on the zoning administrator to make a decision. We just couldn't get one. And, I, and quite frankly, I don't, in, in practical purpose, I don't know that there is a time limit for the zoning administrator, and quite frankly, these can be held out indefinitely waiting on a decision from the zoning administrator, which I'm not here to address that today, but as far as the time limitations or the time requirements or anything like that, that's part of the problem. But just in building it and getting these projects out, there was that time from March until October where they were working on it before they had a decision from public works for them to say, hey, we'd rather you not build this thing. And, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'm 
I'm sorry. Can, you can continue. Yeah, right, that's all I've got at this point. Yeah. Okay. Any 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 final questions from the from the board? Okay, then um, we'll close the public hearing. Just, so just to, to remind the board again, we've had several sidewalk uh, laws over our, uh, or at least uh, some adjustments and uh, different approaches that planning has taken and then a new sidewalk law that is in effect now, which in this case applies um, where the planning department and the zoning administrator uh, make a first determination um, and, and potentially provide a, a waiver or some adjustment to uh, the applicant. And if the applicant's not satisfied with that, then they can appeal it to us. So it's gone through that process and and, the, and we're here today. Um, you know, I, I guess, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, from my perspective, I do sense the frustration of the applicant, um, and and I have no idea what the applicant, uh, other than what they've said today, you know, has done and, and had to go through. But you know, there's no shortage in of cases that we see that have alternative sidewalk plans. It's a, from my perspective, it's a fairly common thing. Um, you know, it. it uh, I'm sad that the applicant didn't um, seem to have that possibility or, you know, propose something or have something proposed, um, but it's there. And so I guess, you know, I, I'm inclined, I think Mr. Lawless had brought it up a minute ago to either defer this for them to, to work on that, uh, but the applicant did say he wanted a decision today. And if he has a decision today, then I might be inclined to, you know, support the decision of the, the zoning administrator and deny the variance, um, but would certainly be willing to have a, an amendment or a, a, a condition to that that would allow the applicant to um, bring the case back to us within um, six months uh, without a fee if they had an alternative uh, plan developed that they wanted approved or, or actually that probably could be done through the zoning administrator. Um, you know, I, I sure don't mind ha them having another crack at it, but it, um, I, I don't see anything that would overturn, um, the initial decision of the zoning administrator and the planning department. Ms. Davis. I'm sorry, Ms. Davis, did you have your hand up, Ms. Davis, or did you just hit the button? Was there any other, any comments from the board? I'm here, I'm sorry, I was double muted. I was double muted. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say that I agree with your assessment and Mr. Lawless' assessment, and then also sort of the concerns that the council member expressed. I am definitely sympathetic to the frustration that the applicant feels and the arguments that his council made, I definitely, um, understand the readiness to have a decision today, but I am concerned that if we did make a decision today, it would be sort of incomplete because we're getting conflicting information. We have the emails that Emily ran it, read into the record, and then we have the perspective of the applicant and his counsel, and it just seems like we need a little bit more information to make the best decision, but um, I would support sort of the motion you hinted at in your comments. Mr. Lawless? Mr. Chairman, I guess I would like to have the applicant state for the record that it does not want to defer this matter for an additional time and it is expressing its strong desire for us to make a decision up or down at this point in time. And then after hearing that, I'm about ready to make a motion. Okay. Um, unless there's any objection from the board by uh, signaling your hand being raised, Mr. Karpenick? I don't necessarily have an objection, but I have a question. Um, and I could not find the zoning administrator's um, actual words on the waiver, um, the actual ruling, but I seem to remember it was that the applicant had to pay in the in-loop fund 
and wasn't allowed to build the sidewalk. And I wanted to get clarity on that from Ms. Lamb. Um, Ms. Carbonet, the zoning administrator is not at this meeting currently. He's unavailable. Um, and I don't have the board packet in front of me because it was 2,800 pages and I decided to save some trees. <laughs> and I can't right. exit the screen I'm on to look at the electronic version. If I recall, and Mr. Collins can address this if, with the board's permission, but if I recall, the waiver application was denied and they were required to bill according to the MCSP. I'm sorry, okay. or pay, or pay. Yeah. So they gave him the option of building according to the standard or contributing in lieu. His request is to do neither. So, and, and let's and see an objection. Yeah, unless I see an objection from the board by a show of a hand being raised, I will uh, reopen the public hearing to allow uh, Mr. Collins to answer uh, the question that Ms. Carpenter just raised and the question that Mr. Lawless raised too about uh, deferral or a, a decision up or down. Okay, Mr. Collins. Just specifically that question. Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, the, the question of uh, if you would prefer uh, a deferral to work things out or a vote up or down was one question. And then Ms. Carpenter, um, I think had the question about whether or not you were eligible to pay, is that right? Yes, I thought I heard um, that this decision um, of the waiver was that they were required to pay and they were not allowed to build a sidewalk. And I wanted some clarity on that, whether or not I heard that right. And then I'll address Ms. Carbonek's question first, if I may. The decision of the zoning administrator was either to build as the sidewalk as laid out or to pay into the fund, was my understanding of that decision that we received in January. There was never any mention of there being an alternative plan or working with Metro or anything like that. That's the first I'm hearing about that today. That being the case, I'll address Mr. Lawless's question and Mr. Taylor's, given the time that and the carry cost that we've had, and quite frankly, I, I don't feel like if the alternative plan was gonna work or there was gonna be one, we would have had a mention of that from some time prior to May. Um, so I'm kind of surprised by that stance at this point, to be quite frank. That being said, and the fact that there are gonna be interest costs to continue to accrue, we would request that there be a decision today. Obviously that decision is within the minds of the, of the board, so that's up to y'all, but that's, that would be our request. Okay, any other questions for that plan? Okay, seeing none, uh, I will reclose the public hearing and um, bring it back to the board. Uh, Ms. Carpenter. Okay, I will make a motion that we um, allow the applicant to build an alternate sidewalk um, that um, is reviewed with Public Works. And then would would it be or would the alternative be or pay into the fund? Yes, or pay into the fund, sure. You, that's fine to add. Which is basically what they can do. I mean, now that has to be up to the full standard, but we're saying you can build up to the full standard, which would not have them here, or build an alternative sidewalk approved by the folks that do that or pay mm -hmm. into the fund. And those are their three options. Correct. Yeah, I think the only option not available to him right now, though, is building an alternate sidewalk. That's why I mentioned that, but we can add all those things in. That's fine. No, no, okay. Ms. Davis? I was just going to second Ms. Carpenter's motion. Okay. So uh, there's a motion, there's a second. Is there any discussion? We'll vote Ms. Carpenter. In favor. Ms. Davis? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Pepper? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I'll vote in favor that motion passes unanimously. Uh, next case. Next case is 2019-1000.
2020-0088 involving property at 1311, 1313, 1315 2nd Avenue North. This is a request for a variance from landscape buffer requirements in the IR district. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property. Uh, aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. This is the site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 88? There's no one here in opposition to case 88. Um, there was some opposition that was emailed in for the board's consideration, but if the applicant is here, you can come forward now and you'll have five minutes to address the board. Um, please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you all. Uh, Emily, I don't, is, Stephen's not here, is he? Stephen's not here. He, I believe, in, sent an email saying he was not opposed to it if the neighbors did not object to it. Um, and then the so did I, guess the, I guess from the urban forester's perspective, he did not have any issues with it, but of course he wanted to give the neighbors an opportunity to weigh in, so. And I'm, 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 I may be uh, putting you on the spot and I apologize if I am, and it's certainly fine if I would, say, I would expect, you know, seven would be the one to, to tell us, but is, is there any uh, overview of, of just what they, you know, what this uh, buffer is that, what the buffer was supposed to be versus what it may be, or is that the burden of the applicant to tell us? Um, I don't have that before me. I can look. We may want to let the applicant start in case he knows. Uh, it looks like, uh, in, in case he knows, if he does, he can address it. If not, I will continue to look while he speaks to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can get started. Uh, my name is James Nyquist. I am with uh, SNH Group rep representing the client. Um, the Variance request is for the landscape buffer. Um, we have a zone change. Our development is on property that is zoned IR. So the zone change to the or zone boundary to the southeast property adjacent to the MULA. Therefore, requiring a B standard buffer. Um, in our case, within the UZO, we are submitting for a five foot wide landscape buffer with a masonry wall. Um, the request is for the to not do the entirety of the length of the property boundary. So our property runs, uh, or the, sorry, the landscape buffer will run for the majority of the property boundary and then will meet pavement where we're not able to actually install the, the greenery. Uh, we have submitted, or we, we have um, allowed to do the, the uh, fence, the, the, uh, the structure. So the variance request is just for the 30 foot, um, the reducing the, the landscape buffer along the property, the property boundary by approximately 30 feet. And it, that's in the very back of the property where the parking is? Yes, sir, right up against the alley. Okay, so where on, on this drawing that we're looking at on our screen now, the six big trees kind of at the bottom of that drawing, that's the buffer area you're, you're talking about? Yes, sir. And so it's just the very bottom of that. And then, did you say you were going to build a masonry wall? Yes, sir. The B5 standard requires five, five, a five-foot width with a six-foot masonry wall. A six-foot masonry wall. And so we got letters of opposition. One is from um, Ms. Edwards, who I believe lives next door, and I don't know if she's on the masonry wall, you know, on that wall side, or if she's on the other side of the property. Um, you know, and had concerns about noise and and uh, things like that. And I think she just um, yes, sir. Can, can I, do you mind? So we that was uh, yes, sir. That was uh, I believe uh, the uh, property owner adjacent to the north of our site. So we were uh, we were actually on consent a month ago, April sixteenth. And they approached us and asked us if we would meet with the um, Germantown Neighborhood Committee. And so we, we deferred our, our request in order to meet with them to answer questions. We sat down with them or got on a call, I guess, uh, earlier this week on Monday night. We answered a bunch of questions. Um, then they submitted that they may still have some questions or some opposition as of this meeting. That's why we're, that's why we're presenting. Uh, but she was to the north, so she wasn't necessarily asking about 
our landscape buffer in general. She just had questions about the, the development. Right. Well, and the neighbor, the Germantown Neighborhood Dis uh, Development Committee um, did write a letter of opposition saying that they felt like it was just because it was overbuilt uh, instead of, um, you know, instead of, um, you know, uh, you know, I guess a real hardship. And and I guess that you have the two historic homes on this on the screen that are kind of on the hatched form, and then the the things that are in gray are going to be new buildings. Yes, sir. So the development is specifically so our our project is specifically the addition to the rear of the two existing historical structures, uh, with the with the um, small courtyard behind it. The okay. uh, the, the square, I guess, shown to the north, what the, the north corner of the site is because we were already disturbing the 1315 parcel. So 1311, 13, 1313, 13, and 1315 will all be consolidated into one parcel because we were actually disturbing the 1315 lot, which is currently vacant. The okay. client elected to potentially have a foundation um, put in for future development, but we're not accounting for any kind of building right now for that area and I, and I guess that to me the, I guess that the big question here though is you know this is uh, in historic Germantown um, and I happened to drive by it by chance not too long ago and and just saw the sign and said oh well that okay that's what that's where this is um, but I, it, it's it seems like one of the the main issues here is the MULA versus IR district, you know, and, you know, you have two really old homes that are in an IR district, which certainly aren't industrial. Um, and what you're building is an industrial, it's commercial. And so I guess if, if this were MULA, if, you're, if your plot were MULA, um, we really wouldn't be here, is that correct? Um, I guess I'm not entirely sure if we were in ULA, if we would meet all the criteria there, but that's probably a fair sentiment. I mean, I don't know, maybe Emily can jump, jump in if, if I'd said something that's, that's wrong, but um, but it, I guess it, it seems like a lot of times when we have these landscape buffer uh, issues, it, it, um, it relates to kind of what what could be there by the code versus what actually is happening. But uh, so the board, I guess we can talk about that as a board in, in a little bit if that, if that is part of it. But I guess if, if you do have a six foot masonry wall going down the length of the property, that masonry wall does continue in this area of 30 feet. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so the, there just won't be trees, but there will be a visual block from the neighbor. Correct. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood that. So, I, I'm sorry. Please continue. Sorry, didn't, didn't mean to interrupt that way. I, I think that's pretty much it for me. Are there questions from the board? All right. Seeing none. Uh, if that's it, then I will close public hearing and ask uh, the board for their thoughts. Uh, Mr. Newton, it's, I didn't see anything in the packet, but is there is there any uh, historic overlays for this that that have, that have to be approved as well? <laughs> but, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. What is are, is there any historic overlay or any 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 further historic kind of approvals that are required uh, for this for this space? Um, you know, I, I don't know that uh, Emily may know, but you know if. If they if there are, then it would be assumed that they have met them. Because, I mean, they're not before our board, okay. uh, and so in, any other. I mean, they would have to meet any other requirement. The only thing we're talking about today is that Just buffer. buffer. Yeah. yeah, it's that buffer between the two properties. Okay, so, thank you, uh, Mr. Pepper. Uh, yes. So the uh, I, I don't. I'm not seeing anything that's unique or any kind of hardship with respect to the lot. And um, I think this is a, a, a very um, unique and important neighborhood. 
I appreciate that they're building a six foot wall, which will help obviously with the block the view, but I just, I don't see any hardship here. And maybe I'm well, missing it, but I just don't see it. Well, I mean, and the only, the only hardship I see is the, is the one that I raised. And that is that you have two old Victorian homes that are zoned industrial because ages ago, you know, I mean, a lot of that area is zoned industrial and the one next to it is mixed use. And to me, it's, it's we see these landscape buffer issues um, come up because of, you know, of this type of thing. And, and to me, that is the hardship. It's like a, it's a, it's like a, a, a mismatch, you know, that's not intentional. Um, you know, what they're, I think what they're doing on their property is not anything different than would have happened down, you know, maybe it is, I don't know, maybe that's something Emily needs to answer. But to me, that that's, to me, that's the only basis of the hardship is the IR next to MULA and, and kind of what's the intent of the impact of it. But again, the, uh, up, up for debate, right? Ms. Davis. I was going to say that I agree with Mr. Pepper. I don't really see a hardship in this case. And I think to the extent that the code and the requirements for the landscape buffer can protect the context of the existing stuff that's already around it, I'm not inclined to vote in support of, uh, in support of this in light of the fact that I can't see a clear hardship and, you know, as Mr. Pepper said, the context. Okay. Mr. Lawless. I was just going to ask either Mr. Pepper or Ms. Davis if that was a motion, and I would second whichever one of them wants to make it a motion, or they can second each other. I don't care. Yeah. All right, let, let's this hear from Mr. Shanti. Then we can. I'm sorry, Ms. Davis. No, I was just going to say this is a Shanti, and since Mr. Pepper spoke first, I'm always going to defer to him to make a motion if he feels so inclined. Okay, I think let's Mr. Newton has his hand up, so I'll um, yeah. better let Mr. Chairman deal with that. Well, let's, let's hear from Mr. Newton and then we'll call on Mr. Pepper. Thank you. Uh, the only thing that, I, just from looking at parcel viewer, it looks like the property uh, one past their neighbors to the north is MULA as well. So it's kind of it's kind of bookended by MULA. And, and like Mr. Taylor said, Chairman Taylor, I, I, I think this is kind of like a mismatch here, you know, from the surrounding properties. I don't know why it's still zoned IL rather than MULA, like the ones surrounding it, kind of. So um, I, I don't know if, if that, you know, I, I, I agree. I think it's a hardship there. And I, I have a question for Ms. Lamb. Is is what they're proposing uh, to do is, could they build that in MULA? You know, I mean, I guess I, I would, I would, I would, if, I would not want the applicant to take advantage of IR and then take the advantage of MULA being around them. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, if if what they could, if they're if what they're proposing is perfectly acceptable in an MULA environment, and and all of the neighbors are MULA, then I think that to me that would represent a hardship. It may not to other board members, and that's certainly fine. But. Um, but, Mr. Chairman, I haven't reviewed that because that wasn't before me. I believe it is available in the MULA, but I, to give you a definite answer, I would have to look at the application, the site plan, and the zoning code with respect to MUL. Um, but the applicant is nodding that he believes they would be able to do it in that zoning district. Again, that's without being able to do any research and preparation because I didn't know that question was going to come up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lawless. Mr. Pepper. Uh, I'll move to deny the application because I don't, on the basis that uh, there is no hardship that justifies it. Ms. Davis? I think you're double muted again. I am, sorry. I second Mr. Pepper's motion. All right, there's a motion and there's a second. Is there any additional discussion? Then uh, we'll take a vote. Uh, Mr. Pepper? Uh, in favor of the motion. Uh, Ms. Davis? In favor of the motion. Ms. Karpinek? Uh, opposed. Mr. Newton? Opposed. 
Mr. Lawless? In favor. And I'm going to oppose the motion. So that motion uh, is held up in votes at this point, three to three. And so I guess at, at this point, the, um, you know, it, the, the, the case will, if, if the case doesn't get four votes, it'll stay on our docket for 30 days. Um, if anyone uh, wishes to change their vote, uh, in the meantime, I will ask if there is um, uh, anyone you know who would willing who would be willing or or thinking that they may uh, want to talk this through some more or to change their vote can raise their hand. If not, then we'll keep this on the docket for thirty days uh, for discussion at our next meeting. Okay, seeing none, uh, this uh, case is held up in votes and will be. Uh, remain on our docket uh, for 30 days. Next case is case 2000. We ready to move forward? Next yeah, I just wanted to make sure everybody was good. And if any of the board members needed a five minute break or if we wanna hear this next case. Seeing no hands, we'll hear the next case. Next case is 2021-20 involving property at 5216 Smart Drive. This is a request for variances from front and side setbacks to construct a garage and a porch addition. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is RS-20. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the property and surrounding areas. This is a site plan that was submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 120? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Preston Quirk, architect. Um, address is 2931 Berry Hill Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37204. Um, I'm here representing Chase and Katie Kemp. They own this corner lot in Creve Hall with a ranch style house on it. The house was built in about 1956. The front of the existing house is located almost at the middle of the lot, about 68 feet back from the front property line. When you do the Metro required setback averaging, the required front setback is 71.4 feet, which puts the front setback line slightly inside the front of the house. It's kind of a curved line if you look at that site plan that's before you. The rear yard for the lot is fairly shallow and there's a large driveway on the right side in the back that um, currently accesses a one car garage. Um, the house is close to the left property line with under five feet available for expansion on that side. So that's not an option. The, the Kemp's would like to have more play space for their three young children and would also like to do two additions and relocate this driveway out of the rear yard. The additions proposed are an 800 square foot two car garage on the right side of the house. It is proposed to be 19 feet two inches from the side property line at the closest point to the side street and 27 and a half feet from the side property line at the front corner. Current setback requirement from the side street Oakley Drive is 40 feet. This is a variance request of 20 feet 10 inches at the southeast corner and 12 and a half feet at the southwest corner since the house is now parallel to the side street. Front corner addition is proposed at just over 11 feet in front of the average setback line. But with that line being curved, this uh, proposed addition is still behind the plane of the front of the existing house. Um, the driveway in the rear is also kind of awkward for them, for people doing deliveries and any visitors. It brings people to the back of the house and does not bring them to the front door. The other addition is a very small addition to the front porch of the house. Um, it's shaded on this site plan in front of you. Also, um, the largest encroachment on that would be three feet at the right side, but it, this proposed front porch addition is in line with the existing front porch of the house. Um, the camp did get support letters from three of their neighbors, the neighbor directly behind, directly to the left, and one neighbor across Oakley Drive. Um, they also had a very nice support letter from Councilperson Courtney Johnson that I think you should have in your packet. Um, the council person mentioned she is expecting that there will be other similar requests in this neighborhood due to the large setbacks required on these lots in the Creve Hall. Um, I also will note there's a precedent that was approved in 2017 at 5112 Overton Road um, for a very similar situation for a garage and it was allowed to encroach up to five feet four inches from the side setback line. 
So based on what I presented to you, we would respect respectfully request approval of these variances based on the unique shape of the lot and location of the where the existing house is on the lot at this time. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Court, this is David Taylor. Um, you know, and I guess, you know, my thinking on this, and, and I appreciate the, the neighbor support and know it's a corner lot. Uh, the one thing that, that wasn't clear to me, um, you'd said 19 feet from the side. Is that to the street or to the property line? That is to the property line at the back and corner. How far, there. That there. How, how far from the property line is it to the street? I don't have that exact information. I'm going to say based on scaling the drawing there, it's probably 14 to 15 feet additional to the street. So so an effective setback would be 34 versus 40, maybe? Yes, sir. Okay, and that because that, that wasn't clear on the drawing, and so that 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 was something that, that would have impact, you know, that, you know, I, I tend to, to look at that, and everybody else can look at it the way they, they choose, but I, I tend to at least give some value to to that effective uh setback um and and i guess the, I, I was had wanted to defer it to the other architect on the panel the uh yeah that was my confusion and i think you helped clear it up uh is why the you know there already is an existing driveway uh that would lead in my opinion to space where this thing could be built and why were the decisions made to um completely relocate the driveway and which forced the garage to be in the setback. Uh, Mr. Uh, was, that, was that a question or a comment? Um, well, I think it was a comment, but it's going to go into Mr. Newton has his hands up, so he may convert uh, that into a question or have a question. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. Uh, I am actually a little bit. So I guess was consideration made to to put this uh, kind of this garage to the rear of the house with, I mean, you could still have the driveway off the front there, uh, but it, I, it would still require a variance, but kind of it wouldn't extend past the end of the house at that point. Uh, as was consideration to that as an option. I mean, we had discussed that, but as I said in the beginning, their their real objective here is to increase their rear yard space, which is now almost half of it's occupied by a driveway and a turnaround, and they would like to get rid of that to have more play space for their children in the rear. And they have obviously have a large lot, and a lot of this lot is eaten up in setbacks as it is, but probably 65% of the lot is accounted for by front and the side setback. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, Mr. Ford, did you have anything else to add? No, I'll just reiterate that there is a precedent, as I mentioned, at uh, the corner. It's a corner lot at Overton and Landon, 5112 Overton, where this board in 2017 allowed a five foot four step back off the side sideline. A very similar situation. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll close public hearing and ask for thoughts. Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, I have a couple thoughts. Um, it made sense to me um, when Mr. Quirk mentioned um, relocating the driveway to the front so that deliveries um, didn't have to go to the back of the home. Um, that made a lot of sense, especially in these times when a lot of us are getting deliveries. Um, it'd give a safe place for a driver to pull into the driveway, not have to park off the road um, and make a delivery. So that that made a lot of sense to me. I don't, and it also makes sense, I think, to clear up the backyard, um, you know, for a play area for kids, I'm assuming. Um, and so I really didn't have a problem um, with this request. I know it is an odd shaped lot and it's not, um, the side variance of 19 foot two is only for a part of um, the garage, not all, I mean, most of the garage is, you know, closer or, or more away from the street than that um, because of the odd shaped lot. So I, I was fine with this request. And there's, there is an additional 14 feet that wasn't uh, shown. Correct, to the road, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, any other, any thoughts? Mr. Newton. I guess I, I, I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time seeing the specific uh, the specific hardship on this. You know, I, I, I don't have an issue at all, and I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Uh, but uh, I don't have any issue with this with the with the 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 front setback towards Smart Drive. You know, I, I, I have some issue with it as it pertains to the setback uh, onto um, Oakley. It looks like there is the side side street. You know, if that could be arranged to kind of encroach less upon that, I, I think that would be preferable. But um, I don't know, I'm, just kind of, I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing why it has to encroach this much into into that setback. Ms. Davis? I was going to second Mr. Newton's comments, even though he is far well more versed in this than I am. Um, I don't see a hardship, but based off of the comments, I, I would be amendable to a variance. I just don't know if the variance has to be this much to accomplish the goals. And I, okay. It sounds like a more of just like, like an idea of like what someone would prefer. And I understand that, but I just need a little bit more on the hardship to get to the the setback towards the back or the back end of the house. Okay. Um, any other any other thoughts? Is did um I guess the, the question is, do we, do you, are there questions for the applicant relating to that uh, specific concern that haven't already been answered by the applicant that might help uh, lead to a decision today or uh, possibly a um, time for the applicant to make a different proposal? Ms. Davis? Um, I don't know where everybody else is on it, but it might be better for the applicant to present a different proposal unless um, Christina's motion or Ms. Kaepernick's motion would have enough vote to pass. Okay, is there any objection to uh, reopening the public hearing uh, to allow those with concerns to that have already been expressed to address those directly to the applicant? Uh, seeing none, I'll reopen the public hearing and um, ask the applicant to address the specific concerns of um, you know, why the exact side setback is needed and the possibility of, of a smaller side setback. And Mr. Lawless, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to ask the applicant if they could perhaps go back and reconfigure it a little bit and bring it back to us. I, it might help because I'm sort of where Ms. Davis is right now and I'm doing my math real quick and not, it's got a long way to go, if that makes any sense. And I don't know if they want to do it in a short time or not. Okay, so, so that, I guess uh, back to Mr. Quirk that the garage is proposed is 19 feet plus uh, from the property line is 34 feet from the street. It needs to be 40 feet from the property line. And, uh, and again, that's at its closest point. And as Ms. Carpenter said, it's not the entire garage. And so the two questions, I guess, out there are, um, you know, is it possible to, uh, and, and certainly it is possible, but tell us, um, the process or why it, uh, what would be involved to uh, get a, a, a smaller setback or a variance request and or um, specifically why, you know, this is the only thing possible. Um, 
Okay. Um, and I guess to answer your questions, um, you know, what we have proposed right now is this addition starts at the end of the existing house. And you know, I mentioned we've talked about the lot has a little bit of unusual shape. You don't have a 90 degree corner here. You've got a curved you know, oak leaf cuts back at an angle to smart drive. So that's why we have this further encroachment at the rear corner. Um, you know, I mentioned that we have, you know, I don't, I didn't check the case history. I don't know if it's possible to check the case history from 2017, but the, the other lot on Landon was a very similar condition. I don't know why that one was approved and we're well, asking for it. Is, and I'm sorry, Mr. Parker, let me just, you, you mentioned this a couple of times and, and I didn't address it and I'm going to address it now just, uh, just for the rest of the board and everybody. I mean, you talk about precedent and, you know, the, our board changes with every new member. Uh, the board in 2017 is not the board that we have today. Every a uh, single member has to look at each case separately and make their own determination based on the criteria. And so, and if 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 your claim, which I, I understand and, and, and appreciate that this is an odd shaped lot and their claim also was an odd shaped lot, every odd shaped lot looks different. And it may have been a corner lot, but it's not the exact same shape and size. So. You know, I've been on this board a long time, and my predecessor used to always say there's just really no such thing as precedent because each case is looked at very, uh, very separately and for its own merits. And so, um, I mean, I certainly appreciate you looking back and saying, hey, and it's not unusual for the board to grant this type of variance. Uh, I appreciate that point, but we're not bound by that type of precedent, and every single case is, is different. So just want to make sure that that point's out there for, for the rest of the board and, and for you. Yes, sir. I, I do understand. I'll leave that alone from this point. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't want the scolding. It just, it was just, it was just, it was just a, uh, we have, we have new board members now too. And I just want to make sure that they understood too, that, yeah, that every, every yes. case is different and has to stand on its own merits. I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, and then to your question about what could we do to rework this? Um, you know, is this the only thing possible? Um, I mean, from, from their, their owner standpoint, they really don't want to do anything in the back because it goes against what they're trying to achieve in the first place to get more rear yard space. So, um, you know, without cutting into the house more, um, there's just not a real feasible way to get a two car garage in here. We can't come forward because we're in the front set back. We can't go to the right because we're in a side set back and they, they really don't want to take up any more of the rear yard. So I don't know that I have anything else to, to add to that. Mr. Lawless, did you have a question? No, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, all, that's okay. I, I, I know by the time we're all used to this electronic system, we'll be back uh, in person with each other. Um, with, were there any questions for the applicant? And, and, and I guess, Mr. Ford, that, you know, what, what I heard, at least from the initial discussion, was you know at least three people expressing reservation on that side setback, and um, you know three reservations are enough to kind of put this in um, in limbo, at least if unless you know there are four and it settles it. Um, and so I guess the question is, would you prefer uh, if it if it appears, and, and certainly each of those three express at least uh, some willingness to consider something different. So if if there are not enough votes to um, approve your variance request, would you prefer a deferral to bring an alternative site plan to us sooner or later? Mr. Chairman, he's uh, consulting with his client right now. Okay. Um, Mr. Taylor, I've discussed with my client, and I guess at this point, uh, based on the comments we have, um, we'd be willing to defer and see if we can come up with a plan that the board might find more acceptable. Okay. I'm going to ask, uh, are there any other questions for the applicant? The, uh, then, uh, I had one, David, David, sorry. Could I'm not sorry, find the sorry. hand. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, that hand is so small on the corner. <laughs> <Ms. Carpenter. laughs> 
Yeah, when you um, come back, this is to the applicant. Um, if you could define the, so the front corner of the garage is a certain distance um, from the property line and it's, I don't see it defined on this drawing. I think that information would be helpful as well as I think there's some dimensions that show the width of the garage and I can't read them because of, I can't zoom in that close to see them. So I think that those, that dimension would also be helpful. I, I can do that, sure. Okay, that was it. Uh, Mr. Lawless, do we need a motion to defer it or is the applicant going to go ahead and move to defer it into how long? Um, yeah, I, the only thing I would, I think would, that may be helpful um, and is if there are any, I know that, that several folks have, have expressed um, concerns and if there, if there is any guidance that you have to the applicant, um, I think, you know, somebody had said, you know, it's, uh, it has a long way to go and um you know how how long you know how how far i mean you know and, that, and, and i think miss carpenick's point of having a little more data in terms of i think that i like the the little dotted line that shows the front setback uh and, and this the the rear but in terms of just how um where each point is you know uh, uh, offensive to the to the code, you know, it's 19 instead of uh, 40 at this one point, but at the other point, it's you know 35 instead of 40. You know, so you get you get a, a, a better sense of of, of, of that. So, is, are there any other needs or thoughts from the board that the applicant could uh, hear that might help uh, you know sway your decision later? Uh, this is Mr. Pepper, um, and I understand the applicant saying that this is the unique shape of this lot, that it's a corner lot and it's a little bit shallower. I think would, what would be helpful for me, and, and I'll just tell, tell the applicant, I think this is a close one for me. I, I'm hearing both sides and, um, you know, still really on the fence. But I think what would, what would be helpful for me is to have some context um, at, that shows me what the adjoining lots, what their shapes are, and what makes the this lot, the size of it, uh, unique. Okay, are there any other thoughts? Then, um, Ms. Lamb, I, the question is, I, it, it looks like this is gonna be deferred to give them another uh, uh, swing at this, and is it best to defer this uh, to a specific meeting, or is it best to defer this? Uh, that can be handled either way. If it's deferred indefinitely without a specific meeting, the applicant would be required to re-notice it okay. uh, with the neighboring letters and the sign. If you want to pick a date certain, um, if the applicant wants to make that request, we can just do it administratively at their request. If you, if the board wants to vote on it, you can vote on it as well. But we do need a date certain okay. unless the applicant is willing to re-notice. No, I think that I think that it's best for everybody to have a have a date on it. That, that I, I had that in my mind. I just wanted to make sure I knew what that was. I'll ask the applicant. Would you prefer a um, a one meeting deferral or a two meeting deferral? Uh, one meeting. Uh, would be two weeks from today. Two meetings would be four weeks from today. I would say four weeks so we can prepare adequately. Okay. Um, It'll be June 18th, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then I'll, I'll move that we defer this meeting or this case till June 18th. Mr. Wallace? Uh, I would second that if that was a motion or if we don't want a motion, you can just do it on your own. Uh, that was a motion, and, and you just seconded, you seconded it. it. Yes. And so uh, we will, unless there's any discussion, seeing none, we will uh, vote, and I'll start with Mr. Lawless. Aye. Mr. Pepper? Aye. Mr. Newton? Aye. Ms. Carpenter? I'm in favor, and can we get a break after this one? Absolutely, and Ms. Davis. I'm in favor. And I vote yes too. That motion passes unanimously. We'll hear that on uh, 
the second meeting of June, and we will uh, if uh, take a what a minute break. That sounds good. All right, so we will uh, reconvene in five minutes. <clears throat> plan that was submitted by the applicant. There are actually two before you because I thought they both were necessary for you to consider. And then finally, the current conditions of the property as well as up and down the street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 121? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. And one note I would make, Robin Ziegler is still on this WebEx event prepared to weigh in on behalf of Historic if the board would like to hear from her. And. Uh, Emily, before we start, would you, um, our, our docket says they, it, they have a, a variance from setback requirements and a special exception. And I know that planning had recommended approval and had addressed both. And so is this? Yeah, that actually, I, I believe it is a setback variance, which um, technically planning would not, oh, it is, if this is in the UZO, then I think planning does make the recommendation. So, so that, that's why that was made. So basically, it's it's a special exception that is for height and setback. Correct. Well, okay. it's a request to deviate from height and setback. Right, but it becomes one of the UCO is a special exception. I guess that I'm uh, usually special exceptions don't require hardships. They have a different set of criteria, and I just wanted to make sure that those criteria apply to both of these requests and that the variance part. Was a hardship. Right. I believe the, the variance, it, the request for the setback is a variance request, so that does require hardship. Um, the height, because it's within the UZO, that is the special exception, and that's why the planning made the recommendation. So there is a different standard for the two, but because it's all on property, all on project, they're considered or requested together. Right, but, but since planning specifically addressed both uh, directly. I guess they, uh, I suspect we, they did that because it. No, that's fine. It's, it's, it's just, I mean, it, plan, planning has definitely recommended uh, approval of the for, of both. Correct. And, okay. And, and, and okay, so they, they, they've they weighed that criteria and their recommendation and their recommendation is to do that. Just one, I mean, again, that wasn't Correct. lobbying one way or the other. I just want to try to clear it up for everybody, mainly myself. Um, that's right. You got it right. When I say, when I say everybody, I really mean me. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to make sure that, 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 uh, that that I knew what was going on. Okay. So, and then if there's any other questions for the uh, code staff, then seeing none, we'll hear from the applicant. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Plummer, an architect with Southeast Venture. I'm at 4024 Crest Ridge Drive, Nashville. With me also is Nathan Narwhal and Bill Brady with Southeast Venture. Uh, bye. Telephone call in will be Robin Ziegler, who will be part of this five minute testimony. And by letter, Catherine Withers write a letter that you have in your file. We won't read that since we have five minutes. On behalf of Mr. Giratana, the developer uh, who got engaged with this property during the work that he's doing on the Ellison Place Soda Shop revitalization, noting that the collective neighborhood goal is to preserve the character of the small one-story buildings that front along Elliston Place. 
the value of this underlying real estate does now exceed the value of these small buildings. So working hand in hand with the Stork and Robin Ziegler, they began talking about a strategy for how he could build some residential units and be part of the revitalization by preserving character of these buildings. So the strategy is to preserve the historic character of five of these historic buildings going back to the 20s by building a higher density building just behind them, juxtaposed as you see in your diagram on the small lot that's available. The hardship is this lot is 115 feet deep. We have to get 15 feet to additional alley width and we're up against an alley that's commercially zoned CS district. So we're asking that that setback be removed. That is the hardship, is to preserve those existing buildings. This project is not possible without the granting of that setback as we are trying to preserve the buildings we're building behind them and slightly above them to retain the character and scale of those one-story buildings. I'd like to introduce Robin now to speak in behalf of the project. Ms. Dick, are you available? I am. Hi, this is Robin Ziegler. Thank you. Um, yes, this is opposite of what I spoke about earlier. This is an opportunity to preserve these buildings. They're not in great shape. They're only one story. Uh, quite frankly, they probably wouldn't be rehabable otherwise. Um, so we recommend approval of the variance so that these buildings can be rehabbed. I will also say, uh, Mr. Giratana and the design team have worked also with Sharon Anthony and the folks of the Anthony family who have retained these buildings since the 50s and had businesses there and are part of the historic nature of the buildings. They're extremely excited and supportive of this and know that the goal here is to preserve what was there and bring it back as it was in the past. With that, we'll take any questions you may have. The, the one question I have, this is David Taylor. Um, you know, I, I saw the rendering for the first time today, and I think it, I really do appreciate the effort that that you all have done, um, and especially working with the uh, Metro Historic uh, Commission. And yeah, uh, and and I guess the question is, um, you know, we have this rendering that's proposed, and do you all have any objection to it? You know, the approval of this being conditioned on um, you know, the project um, being built as per the rendering and any changes would have to be worked through with uh, Metro Historic and um, if there, I guess, was any uh, dispute or discrepancy that you would come back to us. I, I just want to make sure, you know, I, I've been on, There's again. No reservation. Okay. No, There's no reservation. So we present that with the idea that we want you to see what we plan to build and with Robin's involvement and many others, uh, this is a representation of what we wish to build. So we can come back to you as well as the seller, as well as the store, and uh, we'll, we'll work openly with everyone. Okay, and I know, I know that, you know, there, we, we have had projects in the past that, that we, not, not with your company, and I I'm, I'm certainly don't want to give that impression, but that, that I'm aware, but I just, you know, sometimes they, they, we, we see something and then the variance and the, the requests that we make don't relate specifically to what we're showing. And I just, uh, I know that may be a little different with special exceptions because those do uh, do require more um, yeah. approval. And so I just wanna make sure that, that what we see is what is what will be built. Yeah, it, it is, it's a rare request, but it's not unreasonable and uh, we'll just take it at its value that we would come back to you if we had to modify it significantly and let you weigh in on that. Okay, thank you. Are there are there other questions for the applicant? All right, seeing none, but did you all have anything else to add? I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. Yeah, I just want to say I think this is a this is a very good partnership between Metro uh, Historic and and the developer, and I think this this appears to be a really good development. All right, did, was there any, uh, Mr. Lawless? Did you have a question for the applicant? 
not for the applicant, but was your were your comments and the way you were framing it going to be a motion that you're going to <laughs> well, make, Mr. Chairman? We're, yeah, well, it, it, it would be it, once we have closed the public hearing, and I think the applicant still had, had time, so I just want to make sure that the applicant didn't have anything else to say or there weren't any other questions uh, for the applicant. All right, hearing none, uh, we'll close the public hearing. And, you know, I, I do agree with uh, Mr. Newton. It, it, it really does look like a, 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 a great project that has been well coordinated and uh, it's exciting to see um, the historic buildings on um, Elston Place uh, uh, remaining. So I, I would move that we approve the variance request and special exception with the condition that um, if the design deviates from what was proposed today, that they would uh, have to work with Metro Historic and uh, come back to us for approval. Mr. Lawless? I'll second your motion. Is there any discussion on the motion or additional thoughts? All right, we'll take a, a vote. Start with Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Pepper? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Ms. Carpenter? In favor. Ms. Davis? Double muted, Ms. Davis. I'm so sorry, I'm in favor. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> sorry, didn't mean to call you out on being double muted. But uh, anyway, I'm in favor also, so that motion passes unanimously. And, uh, and thank you again for, thanks for all your work and, and good luck with the project. Next case for the board to consider is case 2021-23 involving property at 3308 and 3312 Charlotte Avenue. This is a request for a special exception from the height and setback requirements in the CS district uh, to construct a multifamily development. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning of the property is CS. This is the aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan submitted by the applicant. And finally, the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case, oops, 123? There is somebody in opposition, so each side will have 10 minutes. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. My name is uh, Philip Hearsey. I'm with the House Design Group. Uh, address is 5100 Tennessee Avenue, 37209. Here to represent the owner in this request. This is a special exception request, so I think you know you told me before we need to make sure that the board is acceptable to have the meeting we have. Yeah, you can, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, under the circumstances of the COVID virus and social distancing, we had I had advised Mr. Uh, Piercy that the board has previously approved or been willing to accept the neighborhood meeting having been conducted electronically. So I'll let Mr. Piercy weigh in on that and convey the details, but I believe that he did have the neighborhood meeting, but that it was an electronic meeting. And yeah, okay. since we uh, in-person meeting, what we did was we take the list of um, provided by Metro of the, the neighbors within a thousand feet, and we sent them an invitation to a Zoom meeting along with a description of the project, a copy of the plans that were submitted, the elevations in the site plan, uh, we held the Zoom meeting uh, this last Monday night, um, had a handful of participants uh, that had a pretty good discussion, um, but I hope you accept that as an alternative to the normal in-person meeting under the circumstances. Okay. So, uh, and then... No, go ahead. That's all. That's acceptable. We'll go ahead. Then the um, the request for uh, our request that we have for you is for an adjustment to the uh, allowed height and the setbacks for the structure. Um, the site plan we generated was um, our intention was to show kind of the maximum units we thought we could put on there since the the variance or the the uh, review is not for density but um, for the setbacks and the height. Um, we are, have um, 10 townhomes that are faced on the uh, Charlotte side of the street. They're pulled up to the street and have a center drive behind with the units uh, backing up to the alley, 12 units currently backing up to the alley. Um, 
the uh, project was designed with the community plan in mind. A lot of times when we're dealing with the planning department, they emphasize to us the importance of the community plan and all the effort that went into the community plan with uh, neighborhood involvement and meetings and, and a lot of time and effort. And so the community plan in this, this is in the West National Community Plan and this site along with the adjoining properties that front Charlotte are in a uh, special policy area um, that have several suggestions, all of which we meet in this plan. Um, so generally, they, they want the buildings pulled up to the street the description of the properties are to be higher density residential and with commercial uses on the corners of intersections and residential in the middle, which we are in the middle section of the street. And then with uh, height between two and four stories. There's been a lot of questions with the neighbors about a height of a building and, and I've tried to explain to them the heights that we're proposing are just as similar to what they have with the residential. They are three stories with a basement. So on the lower level, you may have a higher elevation, but in the back, you have the three-story elevation. The site does fall from the alley in the back towards Charlotte with a, a fairly good amount of, of relief. Um, the parcels pulled up to the front, we are dedicating about 10 feet of right away. We understand from the uh, planning staff and public works that we would be required to put in an eight foot green strip, a 10 foot sidewalk, and then would have the property line to the back of the sidewalk. Um, and with our four foot setback that we're asking, we'll be about 22 feet off the curb line of Charlotte. Um, the driveway in the back would provide access to all the garages. Each unit would have a two car garage the ones in front Charlotte would be side by side and the ones in the back would be tandem uh, where you pull a car in behind the other. Um, the neighbors were concerned about the garbage pickup, but all the garbage pickup would be by a private hauler in that internal drive. We wouldn't put the cans back out on the alley. Um, Public Works has been requiring that um, on multifamily developments like this, that there's a statement in the homeowner association that you'll have a private hauler if you don't have a dumpster and that would be the case with this development. Um, the, um, we um, have pulled, um, done, made a lot of effort to try to keep parking off the alley by the center of drive. The, in the UDO, the, each unit would be required to have one and a half spaces. Each has a requirement of two. Um, after the community meeting, we had um, I know the, the staff received a lot more emails, which I've read through, and what I saw were comments involved with uh, the density of the project, the parking and the traffic, uh, trash, the narrowness of the alley, and um, wanted us to adhere to the existing condition or the existing requirements of the current zoning. Um, if we Look at the alley itself. The alley right now is only about 10 or 12 feet wide. So the neighbors are right, it's very narrow. But with our project, we would be widening from our eastern corner, back, I mean, our western corner back toward town, toward the 33rd, and widening that alley. It currently has its full 20 foot, 20 foot right away, and we'd be widening it to its full width. Um, the trash pickup, as I mentioned, would be in the uh, center area. And uh, with regard to the density and the parking, the developer has conceded that, you know, we, we didn't really anticipate the density being a discussion. We had just shown the plan with as many units as we could to depict the height and the setback. Um, but the developer would be willing to sacrifice a couple of units in the back if that would sway the board uh, so that additional, so a couple of guest parking spaces could be added but even with our current plan, we'd be exceeding partial requirements. This would be in addition to what's required. Um, I'll let the opposition speak, and unless you have any questions for me. Wait, I'm sorry, uh, sir, can you just repeat, you, you know, you'd said what, you'd repeat that last bit about the concession and the package. You said you'd be willing to give up a unit or two for what specifically? Um, if we gave up a unit or two, we thought we might provide a couple of guest parking spaces, which is something that the neighbors 
at Express uh, that does a desire for. So, would that uh, also allow you. for a dumpster, or would that just be for the parking? It, we could uh, um, provide a dumpster. The dumpster would have to come off the alley because Metro is not going to come pick the dumpster up in the uh, right in the private drive. And I, some of the neighbors had questioned or requested a dumpster, and I question if those neighbors live across the alley. I'm, if I lived across the alley, I wouldn't want us to have a dumpster that's picked up and, and dumped, but that's certainly an option. Um, but you are, required, our, you are required by law to have someone come pick up the trash internally. Um, public works there, will require with the multifamily development to either provide a dumpster or provide a note in the restrictive covenants that the trash will be picked up by a private hauler. Okay. All right, the, the, are there any other questions for the applicant at this time? Uh, Ms. Carpenter. I do, um, I'm on the drawing that's a rendering and it's showing the Metro required right of way dedication, um, which is, I don't recall the distance there. Um, did you say it was, you're dedicating 10 feet on the front off of Charlotte? Yeah, approximately 10 feet. The um, requirement is, which I found odd, but it was what they uh, told me was required. It's an eight foot grass strip behind the curb and then a 10 foot wide sidewalk. And so we would okay. be dedicating to the back of the sidewalk. And I believe that's plus or minus dedication of about 10 feet. Okay, yeah, so you're dedicating 10 feet and then you're proposing the building to be built four feet from that um, new property line. So in essence, you're 14 feet, the building's 14 feet from um, the former property, current property line, which is pretty close to the 15 foot required setback. Correct? That's correct. Okay, thanks. It is correct. Yeah, that, that was it. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, seeing none, we will uh, hear from the opposition and allow the applicant uh, your remaining time uh, for rebuttal. Thank you, Ford. Um, this is Cap Councilwoman Kathleen Murphy, 231 Orlando Avenue. And I wanted to start with um, kind of some history of this case. So when it was first uh, brought to my attention, and we scheduled a community meeting right before um, we shut things down for COVID, it, um, we were able to schedule a community meeting for in-person, which I did feel that needed to be canceled as things were shutting down. Um, shortly thereafter, we discovered that they had filed um, the wrong addresses on this case. So it had to be re-noticed um, and a new case number. So there was already some confusion in the district and also put us further into kind of the COVID situation of not being able to have a live meeting. Um, the meeting that was held via Zoom this past Monday night, I was notified about midweek of last week and already had a council conflict and was not able to get on that call. Um, they had evidently mailed out letters to, uh, to the neighbors. So it, it does sound like a number of neighbors did get on the call um, because all of them, it appears, have sent me um, letters in opposition, but I did not receive a letter notifying me of the phone call until the day after the meeting because it was sent to the council office and then to me. And so I feel like this Zoom meeting, first of all, I don't feel that it, it meets your board rules um, uh, to justify a, a geographically a convenient location for neighbors to meet. And so I think this should be deferred, especially given uh, the fact that the developer here tonight had said um, where previously they thought that they were going to have uh, trash cans and recycling receptacles in the alleyway. Um, they, uh, and now they are under, they now know that they need to have a dumpster or some sort of private trash pickup in, so internal to the site. And additionally, the fact that they are willing to negotiate on the unit, given the pushback from the neighborhood, I don't think that this plan is, is fully baked and that quite honestly, it should be deferred because the community meeting was not well noticed enough to the council members, uh, let alone to where we could help push it out to, to our constituents. I'm saying plural, obviously there's only one of me here, but Councilman uh, Brandon Taylor's line for our districts is, is right behind in the alley. So these are both of our constituents. 
So um, those are my first two points, but I, I don't feel like the community meeting was valid, and I don't feel like they are fully prepared here today to present you with a site plan that is adequate for a special exception consideration. Um, uh, uh, Councilman Murphy, I have a question about that, and we can our, our board can discuss that. But you know, it it seems like that I mean, your constituents are um, on the Calypso side, and no, the rest my of constituents the are are also behind. Oh, I thought you said Mr. Taylor's uh, Brandon Taylor's was at, was behind the alley. So I have um, a bit of the frontage, and then I go up into the residential portion behind. So this area is called Sylvan Summit. And so I have about five blocks of the residential and uh, okay. Council District 21 has the residential directly behind this property. But prior to Councilman Taylor coming um, in the last election, this area is what I uh, fondly refer to as an area that I co-parented um, with the former councilman and effectively was um, took care of a lot of the issues for all of the residential behind this. So I guess the, the question I have is that it, it, it's a special exception uh, for height, which relates to light and shadow. And, you know, certainly that has been addressed by a number of folks. Um, it, well, view has been not necessarily light and shadow, but I, I, I guess my thought is that we have enough people who've responded to this and the applicant has said that they noticed everybody in the area that they were required to notice. And so kind of given the response, it feels to me like, you know, people know what's going on and have expressed their opinion on it. So, um, I mean, I, I understand, uh, and, it, and it also seems like that the applicant has addressed uh, the, the two dominant issues of, uh, improving the alley and they end up parking. So I guess I'm not sure what else I is think that he's, he's to be accomplished. Some, he's, I'm sorry, Chair. No, that's fine. I'm just one. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, he may have addressed them to what he feels is satisfactory, but without hearing back from my constituents and, and from Councilman Taylor's constituents, I can't uh, I don't think it's fair for, for them to be able to, or for that y'all will have a fair um, assessment of the impact without hearing from them on a new site plan. And of course, I, as I mentioned, I was not on the Zoom call, but I had con constituents texting me today, emailing me today, asking what the phone number was to call in because they were given the impression that, at, again, this is what they were texting me, um, I was not at the meeting, but they were given the impression that they would be able to call in uh, the same way that we're doing for planning. Uh, they said that they were given that impression by the developers and that the developers could be here to present that they would have to call in. So again, that is coming from my constituents texting me this afternoon. And so with that confusion, I think that you would have more people down here speaking today um, and being able to get feedback directly to the developer here in person about the dropping of a unit or two units in the parking. But again, I, I think there was confusion about being able to call into the meeting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could make a point of clarification with respect to calling in, um, we codes determined in conjunction and in consultation with Metro Legal and ITS several weeks ago that the logistics of a call-in line specific to the rules of our board made it extremely difficult to provide the call-in line. Um, that's why we have consistently published the docket on our website as well as Twitter and social media to notify the public that we encourage, strongly encouraged um, people to come to the meeting if they would, or I'm sorry, to con make their comments electronically, but that we would have a remote station set up if they needed to come. Um, I have received several emails from other parties about calling in and I have always notified them the same consistent message. Um, I do understand that perhaps the logistics of a call in line may or may not have changed. And so that's something we can continue to look at. But thus far, we have very consistently conveyed the message to the public and to council members that our meeting meetings would not provide that call and show again because of the rules specific to the board of zoning appeals and we made that decision in consultation with metro legal and, and while well, post may have done that that's, i'm just relaying the concerns of what my constituents 
um, have texted an email today. I was on a Zoom call, and we also got a letter saying it's going to be virtual from the I have to so you can come address the board if you'd like to. You should just speak into the mic. I was not aware we had others here to, Sorry about that. to speak. Yeah, hey, Gilbert Navarro. So I'm on Felicia, kind of behind this. Uh, hey, I, you guys are ready to call, but I've got a letter here saying that this meeting was going to be virtual and you guys were going to give us a call in line. We also, on the call, on the Zoom call, were told that as well. So I think that uh, I will say all the responses you got was a very grassroots effort in the neighborhood, given that there were a couple people on this call. And so I will say the, the, the level of informedness of the neighborhood is really low. Um, we're also told people on the call we're going to get a link. So it's my two cents. Additionally, I think if we, we grant the exceptions on the word that we're going to get some parking spots, like I don't know how many units that is. So in my mind, just to let you guys know, we had a pretty bad house fire on Felicia Street just this Saturday. We had to scramble and move trucks because fire trucks couldn't fit down our street. So like two parking spots on 22 units is going to do very little to, to address that issue. So I'm, I, I have serious concern when it comes to parking. I don't think it's a, it's a one or two spot or one or two units where we have five extra spots. The 11 units in the back are proposed to have a single car garage where you double park into the unit. I don't know a single resident that will ever use both of those. Uh, that's just going to fill our streets, fill our alley. And we already saw on Saturday a house almost burned down because we couldn't get a fire truck down the street. So I think it's just a little, a little bit ridiculous that, that this is even being considered. I mean, you guys should have been there. It was quite quite a scene. And again, I have a letter I can email to you, Kathleen, saying that like there was supposed to be a Zoom link to this meeting and on the call that was also said. So this is my two cents. Can you talk into the mic a little better, please? I'm having a difficult time. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking into like the standing mic. Did um, hi, my name is Alexander Siemens. I also live on Felicia Street in part of the area where it does not directly, it's kind of adjacent to this uh, plot that we're discussing. And I live on the area where I don't believe they're talking about widening the alley. Um, I would add that although the developers seem to have great plans to address some of the issues, those were never brought up during the community meeting as uh, potential solutions. They listened to what we had to say, but those changes hadn't formally been um, brought up for the uh, public to review. So I would just think that before we grant approval of this, that I would prefer that we, as a neighborhood, would be able to discuss some of these issues. Um, a lot of people are very concerned about the, the that alleyway behind the house, and it sounds like they're willing to widen it, but I just don't think that it supports with the step back they're requesting enough of infrastructure to support 22 or maybe now 20 uh, family units. Yeah, I think, I think additionally it was, it was asked on the call if there were any alternative plans to the ones that you're seeing here, and that was explicitly said no to. So I, I don't think any alternative has been shown to the 22 units. I also think it was, it was asked on the call if you didn't have the exceptions, how many units could you have, and that was also not answered. Um, and that'd be something that I'd be interested in hearing, because I think if, it, if it's a 10 verse 22, I mean, I think we're going to know where the neighborhood lands, but I'd also like to see responsible development on this street. There's not another townhome complex within half a mile that has anywhere near 22 units. We've got a, an eight unit townhome complex and one that's coming up that's nine. Um, I think, again, density on this hill is a serious issue, and adding 22 units is, is insane. I mean, it's just insane. A house almost burned down because of it. So, and, and that's before 22 units or the nine units that are being built now. So I think- And Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the time is run. Uh, council Lady Murphy obviously has, is, does not have a time limit, limit as a council person, but the time limit has run cool. for the other opposition. Thank you. Yes, clearly I didn't know that they were here, so I ate up their time. So I, I apologize for that. And hopefully I'll be able to get a few more of these um, things in and try to be quick. Um, I think that the entrance and exit of this development being on an alley, as you just heard from um, constituents who live nearby here, is absolutely inadequate to this type of density um, and the requested setback. These alleys in this area, I have driven it with public works and literally we have stopped going up the hill in some cases because it simply was not safe in a public works truck. This is an area that has just been overdeveloped and forgotten about when it comes to the infrastructure and the idea of 22 townhomes, even if they were one person in each of them, 
entering and exiting onto an alleyway, I think that is just a clear violation of, of safety standards and would like to hear um, you know, how that would be approved. I guess that, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm confused, but I, I saw an entrance off of Charlotte and then you also could, and you could go from Charlotte to the alley, but the only entrance isn't off the alley, right? That's what I thought as well, but as I looked at it closer, and I'd be happy to be wrong with this, it looks like it is um, a grass strip and bio retention. Oh, I, see. I thought I see they were interested in exiting onto Charlotte. Is that not correct? No, I, I see. I see what you're saying now. Sorry. It, 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 yes, you're right. It appears. I thought may, that may have been a different um, version. I know we've seen this. This has kind of been coming and going off of our plate for a while. But I, I was thinking that it was also um, off of the you're, you're right. It is the only entrance and exit appear to be off that off that alley. Exactly, Chairman. That's what I realized today when looking at this again and preparing for this case. And so I just reiterate that I do not think that this site plan is anywhere in a position for y'all to consider it. Um, the applicant also mentioned that this was, uh, while the four stories um, is uh, uh, something that is in the subdistrict of the Charlotte corridor here, um, the, the applicant just told you it's really three stories in a basement. But if you look on their site plan, it says um, roof, roof deck and recessed fourth floor. I mean, I just don't under, I mean, again, that's just extremely misleading to, to pretend that this is four stories, some basement that is underground and maybe for their garage and parking. But when your site plan clearly says recess fourth floor, that's four stories, not not three um, with a basement. So I, I believe that's just been misleading. Again, I apologize to my constituents. I wasn't able to get on the call. Um, but I think with all of this confusion, what you've heard from constituents who were on the call today, um, with the site plan still being in flux and changing, with the only exit on an alley, which I think violates um, um, the special exception rules in the code, I just I think this needs to be deferred. Um, we need to have a community meeting that is well noticed that uh, that Councilman Taylor and I both can attend. That is coordinated in that effort, and um, and I just respectfully ask that you either decline this or uh, or defer it. Okay, Mr. Wallace, I, I think you had your hand up, and I apologize if it's been up for a while and I hadn't seen it. I just. I just reminded myself I needed to look and see if anybody wanted to say something. So, Mr. Lawless. Well, I was just going to ask the council member, uh, have you had any input uh, on this development from the applicant? No, sir, I have not. Okay. Um, that's, what I, that, that, that's what I was hearing loud and clear, so I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Mr. Newton. Yes, uh, I guess, I mean, I, it sounds like a deferral would be appropriate here, um, but I, I would just ask if, if there is a deferral, if, you know, if future documentation could be provided, to, it, it appears this from the picture, this line has a lot of contour change in it, and it would, it would, I, I, it would be much appreciated if there was some kind of uh, contour, you know, elevation, um, shown on on the the supporting documentation for us okay we can and we can talk to the applicant about that when they come back okay. uh, but yeah it, it's helpful you don't i don't get a sense of the the slope and I, I know it slopes up from charlotte to the back of this lot is that right it's it's a i think so it gets higher as you go to the yeah. alley of Alicia. Yeah. but since height is an issue i feel like that's going to be important to know and uh, make a clear decision on it All right okay Ms. Davis? Um, I was actually going to make a motion to defer this. Well, we, let, uh, uh, that's, that's great. It may be a little premature because we have to hear from the applicant again, um, just to, for the rebuttal part, um, and just okay. make, and talk, you know, just let, let the applicant have a say. But, um, but from, from the last, the last two folks, it seems like that's a, a pretty viable option. So we'll we'll talk to the applicant about what needs to happen um, for that to happen. Okay, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Councilor Murphy, did you have anything else to add at this point? No, I don't, but I am happy to see you want to bring me back for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, 
we will uh, hear from the applicant again for rebuttal and specifically address the issue that the council lady has raised along with uh, members of this board to, um, to, to um, you know, again, appreciate the, the uh, I think, obvious effort to listen and respond, but um, the opposition has expressed a, a desire to uh, have that maybe um, be more clear and, and as part of the developed plan. And so I'll ask the applicant to address that and uh, if this were to be deferred, what uh, time table he feels like he can accomplish uh, those things in. All right, well, I'd like to address a couple of things. Um, I hate there was confusion about the meeting, um, but I want to uh, clarify a couple of things. I have the letter that went to the neighbors here in front of me and I'll read from it. The approval process on our request involves appearing for the board's zone appeals at their May 21st meeting. We are required to notify the neighbors and hold a meeting where any neighbor's concerns can be heard and hopefully addressed. Due to the current health crisis, meetings are not allowed. Therefore, unless things change quickly before the May 21st BZA meeting, is expected to be a virtual rather than in-person meeting. Likewise, the city is allowing the neighborhood meeting to be electronic as well. And I went on and provided a Zoom link, call in and all for the neighborhood meeting. In the neighborhood meeting, I take that meeting, I have it available. And in that meeting, I didn't know exactly how the neighbors would confirm or attend this meeting. So I always referred them to the BZA website. I didn't tell them they could call in. I didn't tell them they could come because I wasn't sure. I just referred them to the BZA website for the information about the meeting. Um, and I have that taped. Um, refer to the council lady's uh, request not being noticed. We sent her notice to the council's office, just like we sent the notice to the um, neighbors. I emailed her the week before the meeting, just a reminder. Um, Cause I know how those things slip by and that's how come she was noticed again um, last week. With regard to the trash, we never said we were putting trash cans on the alley. The neighbor kept on referring it to the alley and we were corrected him a couple of times that the trash cans would be a little dry or picked up by a private hauler. Private haulers don't pick up trash from the public right away. They pick it up internal. Um, if the neighbors wanted a dumpster, we can look at providing a dumpster, but it would be on the alley because that's where Metro picks it up. The fourth floor, I hate that that's so confusing. It's not that confusing to me that on one side of the building, when you have a three story building with a basement, one side is four, one side is three. The slopes on this site allow for that kind of relief to have that uh, requirement, as is all the houses up on the hill, all the neighbor's houses where they live, if they go on one side of their house, it's four stories tall, the other side is three. Um, the driveway connection, I am 99% positive Public Works and Planning Commission do not allow a connection to Charlotte. From any of the lots, if they, as they redevelop from, um, from Charlotte, all access is required to be to the alley. That's not our desire or anything like that. It's Metro requirements. Um, if you have any other questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. But uh, I do feel like this was adequately noticed that obviously the neighbors are aware, but if y'all favor a deferral, we will certainly entertain that and see how we can provide more information to the neighbors. Uh, Mr. Newton, you had a question? Yes. Hey, uh, Philip, uh, you said that the uh, the backside is 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 less of a, a uh, it's kind of, it's uphill from, I guess, the elevations that we're seeing here. Do you know what the height is above the ground level on the backside of height of the building? Uh, not off the right top of my head, but it would be, I would say in the 35 foot range is, is I guess I don't think the 
the grades are enough for a full basement all the way around, you know, full basement mm -hmm. buried in the back. But that that's that's just a, a guess. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lawless. Okay. I think I heard that the applicant was willing to consider a deferral. Um, am I correct, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm hoping that I can go ahead and make a motion be, uh, that we least put it off for one month to have the applicant coordinate with the members of the council and the neighbors and present something a little less contentious. Uh, and a little bit clearer because honestly, I've seen this go all over the place today. And without that input, I'm really hard pressed to even consider anything with with a council member and the people that I've heard today in opposition being so adamant. All right. I, I will absolutely call on you first as when the public hearings close. <laughs> so, it, it, which I think will be in just a, a minute or two after, if, if the applicant has nothing else to say. Um, but I guess, I guess one of the things that, I mean, I, I do I do appreciate the applicants, uh, you know, again, responding to, to the concerns. And I think that one of the things that's going to be uh, on our, our plate when we decide this is, you know, the, the is, is really understanding the ask, you know, is it is it a height ask? And I think one of the members should ask, you know, well, if you, does the height allow you to have more units? Um, you know, the, the setback issue, I think, relates to the right of way and improving the sidewalk, which I think is, uh, as a, a, a city benefit. And so, you know, there, there are going to be a lot of issues that, uh, that may be considered impactful to the neighborhood that may or may not be, um, relevant to the request that you're making. So I, I think that that's something that, that once we, um, we do have a, you know, additional time to, for you to talk to the neighbors and that would be, uh, something that we'll have to deal with. But it, it, it sounds to me like they're absolutely not the votes for you to have this special, this, uh, very special exception passed today. And so the question is, uh, do you need one meeting or two meetings to accomplish uh, a neighborhood meeting and um, talk about these plans and get something back to us? Um, and for everybody's own knowledge, the uh, one meeting would be June 4th, two meetings would be June 18th. Okay. I would note that on the community uh, policy that any of the things that we rezone this property to would allow as much height or more that what of the three or four zoning districts that planning recommends, all of those have uh, 45 to 60 feet height uh, allowances. Um, if we deferred two meetings and still weren't ready, can we defer again or is it? Absolutely, yeah. But we, we need to put a date on it. Yeah, we need to, we need to put a date on it so that uh, you don't have to re-notice, uh, but that way it'll be out there. And then if for whatever reason uh, you're not able to do that, then then we will uh, make that publicly known that it's deferred and it'll show up in our agenda as deferred, on our docket as deferred. Yeah. So, so your question when we will be able to have an in-person meeting. Uh, well, I think that's up for the board to consider. Mr. Chairman, if y'all are going to require an in-person meeting for this neighborhood meeting, I would recommend deferring it past June 18th. If you're okay with the electronic meeting, given other meetings that have occurred that way for neighborhood meetings, then I think that y'all certainly are within your discretion to approve that. Okay. Mr. Newton? I think that the electronic meeting is is completely acceptable considering the circumstances. Uh, you know, yeah. Okay. And, and let, well, let's let's. Um, Mr. Christian, do you have anything else to add at this point? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Then I'll, if, unless there's any other questions, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, Mr. Newton, you, you'd address the electronic meeting, and so let's let's talk about that first. Is um, you know, is the public meeting uh, acceptable to be held electronically through Zoom? And I'll, I'll 
have a personal issue with it either, but it, if someone does, then uh, I think we need to establish that because it, it was raised. Does anyone have a question, uh, Mr. Lawless? Chairman Taylor, this is Quan from Metro Legal. I believe uh, one of the first meetings, um, from, if I recall correctly, I believe from one of the first meetings that the board had when there was a motion to uh, allow for um, electronic or telephonic meetings included in that motion was a suspension of the, any board rules that would conflict with that. And so the way the motion was drafted was that that stipulation or that suspension of those particular rules uh, would be in place so long as the executive order from, from the governor is in place, uh, which currently runs through June 30th. Uh, so it's, it's my recollection that, that the board has, has covered that or he covered that in that initial motion that was made uh, a few weeks okay. back, um, but certainly the board could, could make a, a similar or a more targeted specific motion for, for this case today. Okay, well, so thank you, Mr. Poole. So I will just say that unless someone has an objection to that previous motion that the board has passed and wants to raise that now, then we will uh, consider that any um, deferral and additional community meeting can happen based on those criteria that we set uh, upon, yeah, a few weeks ago, which include an electronic meeting. Um, so with that, does anyone have any other comments before we call Mr. Lawless to make his motion? All right, seeing none. So I, I think there, there's a thought to have the motion to, to have this and, and I'll, I'll make it and uh, to defer this case until the second meeting of June. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. That was, I believe that was Mr. Lawless. And so it was. Any... But I would also strongly suggest to the applicant that he probably needs to talk to the council members. Okay. Um, I have a motion. I don't want to make that a condition of it because he may not, but I, he probably should give it a shot. Right. Okay. And so, absolutely. So that, um, I have a motion, I have a second with the note uh, to uh, involve the council members. Um, and Ms. Davis. This also isn't a condition, but I, I, I take the applicant at his word and I think that we're kind of living in a crazy time and you know things kind of get lost on people's minds and because of everything else that's going on. So I would suggest, but again, not a condition, that the applicant consider like alternative designs and present those as well to the community and sort of document the feedback because like I, I'm impressed that those neighbors, you know, showed up and it was that important to them to talk about it and everything that's going on. So I think it might be helpful also for us to make a decision to sort of hear like an outline of these were the concerns we heard. This is how we addressed it. This is our recommendation on how to address it. And I think that might also be helpful to have that kind of discussion in the community meeting. Okay. Any other, any other comments or thoughts that would be helpful to the applicant? If not, then we'll take, uh, we'll vote. We'll start with Ms. Davis. I vote in favor. Ms. Karnick. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Uh, Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. And I vote in favor too. That is deferred until uh, the second meeting of June. Next case. Next case for the board to consider is case 2021-29 involving property at 1203 Kirkwood Avenue. This is a request for a variance from the setback requirements to construct an attached garage. Before you is a zoning map showing the zoning is R8. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the property and surrounding areas. This is the site plan that was submitted by the applicant and finally the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 129? Seeing none, the applicant will have five minutes to make your presentation. Please come forward and identify yourself by name and address, and you'll have your five minutes. 
Emily, can you go back to the picture, the current picture of the property? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Randy Morgan. I reside at 12, well, I will soon reside at 1203 Kirkwood Avenue. Uh, go ahead. Fair, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're requesting a uh, setback for uh, the uh, rear setback for a detached garage. Uh, we'd like to actually attach the garage, kind of a unique situation along Kirkwood. Uh, it's the only street in this immediate area that's outside of the historic zoning overlay. Uh, the contextual setbacks have uh, substantially increased actually over the years as the street has developed from Belmont towards 12th Avenue South, the houses towards Belmont were set back further. So we had a pretty substantial setback greater than what the original house. I was the original owner of this house. We lived there for 14 years, uh, decided to tear down and rebuild on the same place that uh, made our family needs. Um, so this lot is pretty shallow too. As you move from Belmont uh, to 12th Avenue South, the uh, uh, trajectory of the alley um, makes these lots a little more narrow. So um, we're constrained and uh, would like to attach the garage that right now the current plan has a two foot separation between the detached garage and the house. And we would simply like to um, be able to attach the house for numerous reasons, but it seems to make the most sense. Um, given a lot of constraints, we don't have a lot of options for that. So. So the hardship you're you're claiming is just a uh, shallow lot. Yeah, that's a shallow lot. For 128 feet deep. Um, actually, the 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 contextual setbacks for garages along the alley is more conducive to 10 feet. Is more in line with most of these. Um, as opposed to the 20 feet attached. Right. So, I mean, you, there, you're building, are you, I guess you're building up to codes now with a 10 foot detached garage. It just can't be attached to your home. And yes, there's, yes, correct. Right. So, I guess, I guess if you can, if you can have your garage in your home, I'm not sure exactly why we're here other than you really want an attached garage and also a 10 foot rear setback. Correct. So Mr. Chairman, the rules with respect to a detached garage is that the setback is 10 feet. Um, for an attached garage, the setback would be 20 feet. So it's ultimately just a request for a rear setback variance to allow an attached garage at 10 feet. It, the garage, my understanding is currently detached. So it exists meets that setback requirement. They want they want to attach it, which makes it a 20 foot setback variance, I mean, a 20 foot setback requirement, but because it's already existing as a detached garage with a 10 foot setback, they need a variance since but it's the garage, detached. Yeah, the, the garage doesn't exist now, right? It does not. Oh, okay, right. that was the, okay. I, then I misunderstood, that was, that's, then I misunderstood this application, so by all means, correct me. Okay, yeah, sorry, so yeah. Um, yeah, so in, in the, zone, the RA zoning district, um, is, there's not really a whole lot of information on it other than it says if you're attached, the rear setback is 20 feet. If you're detached, the rear setback is 10 feet. There's not really any language that says how far is to be detached. It seems to me to be a, a kind of a one of those codes that kind of floats around. There's not a whole lot of really definitive, it's kind of ambiguous, I guess, and what the attached versus the detached actually means and does. In this case, there's simply two feet of detached um, wall space. Um, that would just make a little more sense functional wise to attach it. I'm not sure really what the harm to the public would be for the attached versus the detached within those two feet. Um, it seems to be in keeping with the 10 foot setback on the alley as far as the other garages up and down uh, this side of the street. And had a lot been deeper, it would have been less of an issue, I guess. 
kind of hemmed in uh, with the contextual front setback and then uh, the 20 foot setback if the gar garage were attached. Mr. Pepper? Uh, you may, um, this is a question for the applicant. You may have answered this. Why is it you need to attach it? The way it's, it's spec'd out now, there'd be a two feet, two foot gap, essentially, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And then, and you want to, uh, it, do I understand you want to attach it? I, I'm not sure quite what difference does it make, whether there's a two foot gap or not? Do you get an additional two feet of space? Is that what you're looking for? Yes, sir. It becomes a uh, construction means issue um, and maintenance in between the two walls, basically, um, with it being two feet. Um, I, it, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess to your point, it's like, golly, it's, almost impossible to build it now that I'm trying and it's been approved and then but it's and it's just two feet. It doesn't really I mean what it does to us personally is it allows us to enter the house or the garage from the house without having to be um outside. But it's it's two feet of space that yes it does it it gives us obviously two more feet of enclosed space but um I mean, really, it really makes the garage function better. Right now, the garage is a little tight. Um, it's just, yeah, I mean, we're just kind of pinched um, from the front and the back, um, given the lot size and depth. Mr. Lawless? I, I, I'm just looking at it, and, and what's the detached wall space if it hasn't already been built? I mean, I'm looking at the, the site plan. I'm just, are you just trying to combine it, just connect it? Yes, sir. Okay, that's a little different than what I understood you to be saying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, and, and tell me, tell me, I mean, I understand the desire to, um, you know, to, to want it to attach and, and, and uh, connect to the home. But I, I have a little bit of a problem with the um, with with the request because I, I just have enough architect friends in the working in that historic district who would love to be able to have an attached structure that uh, goes back to ten feet. I don't see Ms. Ziegler on the call anymore, but um, she could certainly address the fact that they just don't do that. And and I almost I know that they do allow. Um, a little closer sometimes to the alley than 10 feet. And, you know, I think I might be more willing to, you know, consider a eight foot setback. So you'd have four feet between your, your homes, um, than to actually allow the garage to attach to the home. But that's, that's just where I am right now. Um, and to be clear, I, we are not in the historic zoning overlay. No, I understand that, um, but you know, there, and I, I'm just telling you what I see on paper is that, it, that you can see too, I believe is, you know, a, a lot of choices that were made that, um, that don't scream hardship. I mean, I, and it's, it's like the house is built. Now we want to do the garage and that's the right spot for it. And I get that, but you know, it, it seems a result of choices, not necessarily just the lot. Um, well, I mean, it's a combination of things. It's, the problem is, is that uh, there's a lot of problems. Had I had my druthers, I would have asked for a front setback variance because the house needs to be closer to the street. But given um, the nature of uh, the contextual setbacks and really how it does nothing to improve the overall character of the street, and it's really a whole other issue but regardless my house is set back the new house is set back further than the original house so had i been able to come up further to the street which from an urban form perspective would be better uh, then i would have had enough room 
uh, to either fully detach or fully attach the garage. But to your point about actually moving the house back further along the alley, that would be more out of keeping uh, with the general context. But not only that, it requires uh, less turning movements or requires more turning movements in and out of the garage from the alley. Um, so the 10 foot is really more about being able to get into and out of uh, the garage. Um, there is a provision that allows a three foot rear setback if you access the garage from the side, which in this case doesn't work because of the topography. <clears throat> so we're limited to coming in from the alley directly into the garage. What's the topography that keeps you from doing it? I drove down that alley um, not that long ago, and there's an awful lot of homes that have, like the one right behind you comes in off the alley. That's right, but they're at the top of the hill. So the hill, so the alley is on the top side, uh, and it, the topography slopes down each side. And on my case, it goes towards Kirkwood. On the Cedar Lane side, it, the topography falls pretty sharply to Cedar. So, I'm, well, there's about a three foot difference. For me to make a turning movement into my lot to access a garage from the side would, would require retaining walls. Okay. Mr. Pepper? I forgot to untape un to take my hand down. Sorry. Do that right now. All right. Mr. Lawless? I, I'm just curious why you, we didn't get a setback variance request versus sort of the convoluted way we're getting here now. I'm just scratching my head and maybe the applicant doesn't have an answer to that, but I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, I spoke with my council member and the neighborhood association members and several neighbors immediately uh, in the proximity. I know most of them there again for being there for 14 years um, previously before we, we built this house. Um, I mean, putting our heads together, it's hard to determine actually what this rule actually does or what the intent is. Um, that would be helpful, I guess, as far as understanding exactly um, what the issue would be between leaving a two foot blank space between a structure and attaching it. It, it sounds like the difference, the request is just for an attached garage with a 10 foot setback. Yes. So that, the, Mr. Wallace, I think that's the bottom line question. Is it the request for a variance from the rear setback so that they can construct an attached garage. To construct an attached garage requires a 20 foot setback and they're asking for a 10 foot setback. Which would have been a yeah. lot clearer had it been presented that way. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the clarification. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, sir, was there anything else that you'd like to add? I'm sorry, Mr. Newton. Would the applicant, if this was determined to be the case, is a better option? Would the applicant be opposed to um, making it what is a uh, would be ten point five plus one point eight, so about a thirteen fourteen foot setback, um, just shifting the the detached garage over uh, rather than uh, you know, margin that garage? Does that make sense? Are you, are you saying instead of adding two feet to the garage, just move the entire two feet? Right. Would you be opposed so to that as a... Foot, so instead of having a 10 foot setback, I would have a 12 foot setback? Right, and in that case, would you be opposed to that? I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I, I mean, I'd rather have the two feet of functioning space given of garage space, I'm already having to limit, in order to make the 10 feet, I'm having to make my garage smaller. I mean, it's the bare minimum. So uh, yeah. attaching it would definitely help function wise, mainly because of the access from the alley, as I spoke about limited turning movements coming in and out, but um, 
Yeah, I think I think I would like to keep their ten foot rear setback. I would just like to attach as a, as opposed to the detached. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or thoughts? Uh, Mr. Morgan, did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, sir. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. We will. Ms. Davis, did you have a question? No, I'm anticipating you closing the public hearing. All right. I'll close the public hearing and call on Ms. Davis. Um, so I definitely understand the applicant's perspective, but to some extent, I feel like this hardship was self-imposed. And I think um, Mr. Newton tried to craft a compromise that I likely would have been able to support. But as the variance request is presented, I don't see a hardship and I can't support it. And I make a motion that we deny the request as presented. Okay, there's a, a motion on the floor. Um, Mr. Lawless, did you have a comment? Uh, I enthusiastically uh, trumpet the comments of Ms. Davis and second her motion. All right, there's a motion and a second um, discussion. I, you know, I, I've got mixed thoughts on it. Um, you know, it, it is a narrow lot. I wish that they had anticipated this sooner and asked for a front variance request, which may have had more weight based on the two houses that we see next to it. Um, but, and I, and I also am more inclined to allow a rear setback closer to, you know, somewhere between five and eight feet, because that's, I think more common in this neighborhood and would give more space between the home. Um, so I, I, the attached part, I, I have a trouble, I have trouble with, although it, it totally makes sense. If I were the homeowner, I would want it, but I'm, I'm still struggling with that. Is there thoughts from our architect, Mr. Newton? Well, my only thought is that, is that I mean, 1.8 feet between two structures is pretty worthless and it's gonna be a, an eyesore in the neighborhood because nobody's gonna be able to maintain that. You know, I guess you could put a, you know concrete across there or something, but I mean, I don't, I don't even know how you hardly fit somebody in there to build that, but uh, um, get the skinny guy that day, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Again, I think that there is there is some kind of compromise that could be made, but I, I, as it currently stands, I don't think that's the the best uh, the best solution. Uh, Mr. Pepper, uh, yeah, so I, I agree with Miss Davis. I I don't see a hardship here. You know, I see from the homeowner's perspective and from other people's perspectives how it seems, in one sense, like. The setback changes a lot, whether just because you attach something. And I guess in some instances, you know, some people could have different opinions about that. But the way I look at it is people that have spent a lot more time and energy thinking about why that needs to be in the zoning code and how it benefits um, neighborhoods, uh, they've spent a lot more time on it than I have. And um, so, you know, I, I I don't see any hardship, and I would support the motion or the, the yes, okay. I'd support the motion. Ms. Carpenter? Well, I'm on the fence about it um, for, you know, those practical reasons is how is it going to be built, and that is a dead space in between. Um, but I do see um, Ms. Davis's point and Mr. Pepper's point as well. Um, I guess my question is whether or not, you know, for an R8 uh, zoning, there's a maximum building coverage of 45% of the lot. And I don't know, I guess detached um, accessory structures are considered in that. Um, but I'm just wondering if this lot is going to be overbuilt um, and exceed that 45%. And I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that question. Oh, Ms. Carbonic, I can't. I can tell you that whatever he built would have to meet the zoning code. So whatever he has submitted, and if it's approved, it would meet the zoning code. And if it's not approved, then he would be back at the BZA. Okay. okay. So that so detached structures are considered in 
as part of that 45%, there's not a special uh, provision that they're excluded from that, the maximum building coverage? Uh, I don't know that that's before the board. Uh, it would take me a minute to look for that, but I can find it if you'd like me to. My understanding is that all services that are pervious or impervious are determined to be uh, your building coverage. And so in order to get the building permit to begin with, which we have clearly because we're building, we had to pass stormwater requirements as far as pre and post impervious surface. So we're well within our range on that. Yeah, I believe it, I, I believe it would be considered, but again, I'd have to look specifically in the code and I'm not sure, I don't think that's before the board. Well, it's, it's pervious versus okay. impervious. So. I mean, in terms of the variance, that you're, the request is just for an attached garage. Yeah. Well, that's oh, true. It's, it's for the variance. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's true. But if we're adding the sliver potentially um, to the building, then maybe it does put it over that 45%. That's something I just, it's not shown here. Um, well, then I would be building outside the building permit code if that was right. the case, but that's, that's not the case. Right, that's what I'm saying. I mean, whatever he builds is going to have to comply with the zoning code. So if you grant the variance, then we, we would have to, we would look at the building permit and make sure it complies with the zoning code. Okay, so there's another layer. There's another step after we're done here. Right. Um, so I guess the only, the only question I have, I mean, and, and I, I'm still struggling too, and I appreciate the... Um, I mean, I, I share the belief of the motion, but I also am empathetic with the, the request is just enough to, you know, ask if it if it uh, warrants allowing the applicant to, you know, come back before the six months to, to request a different rear setback um, to move the, the garage to the alley um, closer. I, 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 think that a closer setback is not uncommon in that neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I would be willing to consider that. And, you know, it's not before us today. The applicant has said he, like, he really would prefer an attached situation. But I, I, I would, I would be willing to give the applicant an opportunity to uh, present another uh, plan for a detached garage closer to the alley and further for his home if others uh, agree to that. Otherwise, I think he has to wait six months to uh, to make that uh, that proposal. And, and Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I was looking, trying to answer Ms. Carpenter's question, so I missed part of what you said, but he can make the request prior to six months if it's a substantially substantially different enough request. If it's gonna be the same request, you've gotta make wait six months. Okay. So if you all if you all determine that that um because he's proposing an attached situation, if he proposed a detached situation further, you could you all could determine that that was different and he could bring it. I believe so. Again we would we would depending on what he brought, we would make that analysis. But yes, if we determine that it's substantially different enough from his current request, we could bring it to you even if he comes in tomorrow and makes the application. Okay. That, that, that's, I just wanted to make sure that that opportunity was there. Correct. Any other, any other comments or thoughts from the board on the motion? Uh, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, we'll vote uh, starting with, I think Ms. Davis made the motion with Ms. I'm sorry, Mr. Newton, did you have a question? Can, we, can you clarify the motion on the, on the floor? I believe the motion was to deny the request for lack of hardship. Is that right, Ms. Davis? Yeah, it was, but in light of the discussion that you just had um, with Ms. Lamb, I'm willing to amend the motion to, you know, work with the applicant. So, if, Mr. Taylor, if you wanted to amend my motion, I would support that. Well, the, the amendment would basically be to allow the applicant to present another plan without fee. Um, prior to, you know, six months for us to consider, given obviously the, you know, he, he certainly knows where the board stands on the current request and it would have to be um, in response to the, you know, the, the hearing today. But if, if he if he feels like he's gone back and reheard the hearing and has listened and said, hey, I think they may support this and, you know, here are all the garages. I mean, there's no shortage of garages at, at Metro Historic. I know he's not in the historic district, but in that neighborhood that are closer than 10 feet from the alley, uh, if that would help his property. Like, so that, that's, that would be my 
uh, amendment um, that would allow him to present something different sooner. Well, I accept that amendment to the motion. I'm, Mr. Lawless has his hand raised, so yeah, um, Mr. Lawless. I'm willing to withdraw. Can, can I just ask before we we amend or change where we are, if we were to vote to pass Ms. Davis's motion, then, and I guess I should address this to Ms. Lamb, would he be able to come in tomorrow with a new basic plan and more in line with what we're talking about? So we're starting from scratch. It's so the only... He could, it would cost him money, and I just would say he wouldn't have to pay the extra fee. I just didn't think that was fair to have to pay another $200 to amend a plan. That so was the motion, I'm not, I'm a little bit lost in what the motion on the table is. If it's to deny, then yes, he can come back in tomorrow and he can submit a different site plan, different, sufficiently different that we can get him back on the dock at the next available BZA meeting. If the request is to deny it with the caveat that he can reapply without the fee, then that is certainly something we could do. Um, Mr. Lawless, I'm not sure if that answers your question, because again, I'm a little bit lost on what the actual motion on the table is. Well, we've, kind of gone, in, we've gone in a lot of different directions and I was trying to do it the cleanest way possible. And Ms. Davis, I'm sorry, I talked over you. I apologize. No, Mr. Lawless, I appreciate you trying to get us back on track. So I, I think from my perspective in its current form, the applicant won't prevail today. And in response to Mr. Taylor's comments about trying to work with the applicant, going to get more information about what the context is around this particular home, and then coming up with alternative designs, it seems to me it might be cleaner just to deny the request as written, but with the condition that the applicant can reapply showing different alternative designs for this garage, and we would waive the application fee. Uh, you could do that, or you could um, just simply defer the case to give him an opportunity to, to bring something different to the board. Um, and I was thinking keep... that. I was just waiting for you to tell me that. That's, either that, either so one of those would work. Most... So I withdraw my original motion, and I make a motion that we defer this request, and the applicant has six months to bring back something else. And uh, Ms. Davis, if I might recommend, um, he can bring it back before six months if he has it. We would just, we'll kind of consider this an indefinite deferral and he would have to re-notice it since there's not a date certain. But that, and that would require, that would, he would incur co the notice cost, but that's not the filing fee. Thank or you he, has, he has a month and then he could administratively defer. Y'all could certainly give him a month, defer it to June 18th, and if he is not ready by that point, he can notify me and I can defer it administratively. Maybe we defer one meeting. So that would be June 4th. If you think you can get the information that they're requesting an alternate plan or something by June 4th, then you can certainly do that. And again, if you're not ready by that point, you can let me know um, and I'll announce it to a specific date at that point. Yeah, I would, if, if possible, I'd like to request a uh, one meeting deferral. Okay, so I withdraw all my prior motions. And <laughs> my new motion is that this matter be deferred until June 4th. And at that meeting, the applicant present alternative designs and also, also information about the context around him regarding his neighbors and the setback from the rear. And I'll second it. I have a motion, I have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ms. De uh, Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, I would like to know the square footage of each structure. Okay, so the applicant will note that and, and provide that when they when the applicant uh, returns. So, so you all want the context of the surrounding areas, the square footage of the structures. Is there anything else we missed? I think he said the setbacks of the neighboring property. The setbacks of the neighboring property. All right, so we will vote. Ms. Davis? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Ms. Carpenter? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Mr. Pepper? In favor. And uh, yes, that is deferred when meeting. And do, folk, do 
folks need another quick break, Ms. Davis. No, I'm sorry, my hand is just still up. All right, did anybody need uh, a quick break before we go to the short-term rental docket? Yes. Well, all right, uh, do five more minutes and reconvene at 425. Ish. And 2108. This is involving property at 1820 Joy Circle. This is an item A appeal challenging the denial of a permit due to operation after a permit expired. Mr. McBroom is here on behalf of CODE to make the presentation. Is the applicant here? If the applicant is here. Is there anyone here in opposition? No one's in opposition. So after Mr. McBroom speaks, the applicant will come forward and you'll have five minutes. Good afternoon, board. And may I say it's you got to speak up. Good afternoon, board, and may I say it's uh, wonderful to be held in such high esteem by the chief zoning examiner, but <laughs> at any event, we will get started on um, 1820 Joy Circle. Uh, on 1227 of 16, the permit was issued, permit renewed on January 19th of 2018, and again on November 19th of, um, or excuse me, of uh, 17, and again on 11, 19 of 18. 20, uh, 12, 27, 19, the permit expired. On February the 25th of 2020, notice of violation was sent by Mr. Campbell Padgett. On uh, March the 5th of 2020, the advertisement was removed. On March the 9th of 2020, the BGA appeal was filed and the advertisement was reposted. There were 205 documented stays, seven of which occurred after the expiration and two of which occurred in March. There were no other documented complaints against the property and no other actions were taken. Okay. Any questions for Mr. McBroom? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We'll hear from the applicant. Do we have to? Hi, this is Todd Sisson, uh, owner and resident at 1820 Joy Circle. Uh, Mr. McBroom, I appreciate your statement and members of the board, your time as well. Um, I did want to make a plea in earnest to apply for my short term rental permit before the one year renewal phase processes. Um, I can attest that the uh, expiration of my renewal was an honest mistake. Uh, it was not an attempt to operate without uh, being in accordance with the permit guidelines. Um, I believe there may have been a failed reminder um, as I have applied uh, for renewal every year successfully. Um, the reason I'm asking to be able to apply for a permit again before March of 2021 uh, is just for financial reasons. So um, it was already a significant portion of my income before uh, any economic hardship that's uh, happened recently with events in the, the COVID epidemic. Uh, so it, it would really be helpful for me to be able to resume that. Um, I have been able to take advantage of long-term rental, but that's been about 28 to 30% of what I was earning before. Um, on a personal note, I recently finalized a divorce in January and my income was 
based on potential earning from my short-term rental as well. Uh, so I am in jeopardy of losing my home and have already started to accumulate debt on the property uh, just to maintain until we can come to a decision on when I'll be able to reply, or, excuse me, reapply for a short-term rental permit. Um, I can attest that I was unaware that the permit had lapsed uh, just due to personal reasons that were going on. I continued to make payments to the Department of Revenue on all of my occupancy taxes. Um, it wasn't, you know, that I was trying to shirk any responsibility again there or, um, you know, obtain any monies without being under, under code and permit with the city. And that's all I have. Um, Ms. Sisson, can you tell me, um, this is uh, David Taylor, Chair of the Board. Can you tell me if, um, it, it sounds like you got, from what Mr. McBroom said, that you got uh, a notice uh, toward the end of, uh, well, 1st of February, and I guess, what happened? Did you, did you take down your listings? Did you cancel your listings? It sounded like there were a couple of reviews in March, which may have been staged or may have been staged in February that got reviewed. I don't know how all that exactly works, sure, but sure. tell me what happened after you got your notice. Yep, I'm sorry to speak over you, and that's a great point. So upon receiving the notice, I believe that came in early March after the letter was sent, I did cancel reservations. There were already a couple that had already taken place by the time that the letter did come to me. Um, I immediately pulled down the listing and came into the Metro Code's office to talk about what next steps were, if I could renew, and then found out you know, that I needed to have the waiting period and my permit would be pulled. Uh, so after that, I, as I was advised by the Metro Code's office, um, included in my listing title, 30 day plus only rentals long term. Um, and excuse me, 41. Okay, so I'm being shown by Mr. McBroom that uh, on the 25th of February, the notice was sent, and on the 5th, my advertisement was removed. So I'll have to assume that that was the date that I received the letter. Um, Let's see, 3 9, the BCA appeal filed. It did take me a couple of days of waiting in the Metro Coast office before I could be seen and, and file the appeal. Um, and then I'm not sure, Mr. Groom, is that correct? Uh, I should be showed 205 days, but I'm not sure what that refers to. Is that just in the last calendar year or? 205 documented stays, uh, seven documented stays after expiration, two of okay. which occurred in March, but the letter was sent in late February. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank you for the clarification there. So again, um, there were a couple of rentals that, that occurred in March after the letter was sent, but that was just simply the, the time it took for the document to make it to my mailbox. Okay, but you didn't, you're, you're testifying that you didn't, uh, you did not rent your home after you got the letter. I can definitely attest to that. As soon as it was sent to me, I pulled it knowing that I didn't want to create any more complications if I was going to reapply. Okay, all right. Great, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? All right, Mr. Sisson, did you have anything else to add? No, I appreciate the consideration. Okay, uh, then we'll close public hearing and just uh, since we have a new board member, um, just say that, you know, the, the STR, the short-term rental laws have changed so many times since I've been on the board and um, sometimes it's hard to know which which law applies. And in, uh, I think it, uh, the law that applies is the one that, uh, that was in effect when the applicant got uh, the first license. And in this case, uh, it's my understanding that the applicant uh, got uh, his short-term rental license at a time when we do have flexibility to um, provide less than a year penalty if the applicant, um, you know, were to reapply after committing an, an offense like uh, property after an expired permit. Is that correct? Mr. Taylor, that is correct. I'll give a very brief primer for the sake of Mr. Newton. The state law um, dictates that the law, the local law in effect at the time the permit was issued is the law that governs that permit. Um, so with nine, I think, maybe 10 uh, local ordinances in the last four or five years, as well as a 
state law. There are many laws to keep track of. We do our best to help y'all keep track of those. In this particular instance, the permit was issued at a time that the board had discretion to reduce the one-year wait. Some of the law, some of the ordinances for Nashville require a mandatory time period um, that the board cannot deviate from. Um, some of the ordinances allow you to deviate from them. This particular issue is, or this particular permit was issued at a time when the board did have discretion. And so therefore, according to state law, that local law governs and you do have discretion to reduce the one-year waiting period. Okay. I appreciate the primer. So uh, to me, uh, to me, the applicant has uh, followed the rules, got, got the notice, stopped immediately. It's been uh, almost two and a half months, maybe a little more than two and a half months since the applicant has rented his property. And since he had an expired permit, that means that uh, before he had an expired permit, he did everything correctly. So I'll, I'll move that the applicant uh, that the zoning administrator did not err, that the applicant did rent the uh, home after the permit had expired, and the applicant will be allowed to uh, apply again for a permit on Monday. Ms. Carpenter? I'll second that. However, Monday's a holiday. Oh, then uh, Tuesday. Is that okay? That is. Okay, so I have a motion, I have a second. Or is there any discussion? And I'll call on Ms. Carpenter. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Ms. Davis. Double muted. Maybe. All right. I haven't heard, Ms. Davis, I haven't heard from you. Uh, I'll vote in favor. And so. She may be you know, having te technical difficulties. Like but technical difficulties, like it's coming uh, on and off. I'm sorry, I'm back and I vote in favor. All right, good. Well, six, six to nothing that passes. Uh, don't rent your home until you have a permit uh, com fully completed and in hand, uh, but you're able to apply again for that permit on Tuesday. So next case. Understood, thank you. Next case, 2021-12, involving property at 1108 Berwick Trail. This was, um, this is an appeal of a denial of a permit due to operation after the permit expired. The applicant here. Uh, Bradley McCaughey, Mc, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. 2021-12. Mr. Chairman, it does not appear the applicant is here. You may want to consider deferring this one meeting to give him an opportunity to appear before you. I'll move that we do uh, for this one meeting. Is there a second? I'll second it. Mr. Law is seconded. Um, Mr. Law, is there any, any other questions or comments? All right, Mr. Lawless. Uh, in favor. Uh, Ms. Davis. In favor. Ms. Carpenter. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. I'll vote uh, in favor also that's deferred one meeting. Next, Next case, case. 2021-16 involving property at 11 Music Square East, number 407. Is the applicant here for this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's cancellation of a permit due to an ownership change. Uh, Mr. McBroom is here to make the presentation on behalf of staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 116? There is opposition to this, um, so each side will have 10 minutes. Um, yeah. I would yeah. note that I, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could, 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 since this is a, a different type of case, could you uh, tell us what the, the rules are in terms of change of ownership just for our benefit since we certainly, never heard that of Mr. Certainly. Uh, so Newton. The local ordinance um, and all of the local ordinances dictate that the nobody can, you cannot operate a short terminal permit without a, the owner obtaining the permit. Um, and that, so because of that, when an owner of changes, obtains a permit, when the property ownership transfers to another ownership, even if it's a trust, even if it's an LLC, even if it's 
another person, that new entity or person is required to obtain the permit. Additionally, state law dictates that um, Again, the local law in effect at the time the permit is issued governs unless the, among other reasons, unless the ownership of the property is changed. So in this particular instance, um, the Gaskins obtained the permit. At some point after they obtained, obtained that permit, they transferred the property to the Carlos and Cheryl Gaskin Revocable Trust. Um, that is considered a transfer of ownership sufficient to essentially kill the initial permit, and so the trust would have to obtain the permit. Um, once Metro Code, did, it came to our attention that there had been this ownership change, we notified them that the permit was no longer valid because the property ownership had changed. And so that's what they're appealing before you now is that notice of cancellation that the permit was no longer valid. And again, that, that's to do it to state and local law, both dictate that the ownership change um, essentially kills the initial permit. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll hear from, do you say Mr. Big Broom on this one too, or? Correct. Awesome, okay. Mr. McBroom. Uh, this is a non-owner occupied permit, which uh, is still available in the zoning area. It's an ORI zone, office residential intensive. Um, the permit was issued on 7-5 of 17. It was renewed in 2018 and 2019. On 1-7-2020, ownership changed from Carlos L. and Cheryl W. Gaskin to Carlos L. and Cheryl W. Gaskin Revocable Trust, canceling the permit. On March 23rd of 2020, the cancellation letter was sent. On March 21st, 2020, the BGA appeal was filed. On March 21st and 23rd of 2020, the advertisements were removed. There were 100 and 53 total document stays, nine of which occurred after the ownership change, no document stays after the cancellation letter was uh, received, and no documented complaints on the property, no other actions were taken. Okay, and so, so the applicant, uh, you said, would be eligible to, um, is, there, is, is there any issue with the waiting period or anything like that? The applicant could, it, once, the, once this happened, the applicant could have Typically, assuming that they um, stopped operating after they were notified of this invalid permit and assuming that they meet, otherwise meet the eligibility requirements, they could obtain this permit. There is no waiting period. They didn't, they're not here before you appealing, you know, operation on a permit, an invalid permit or operation on an expired permit or operation without a permit. That's what requires the one-year waiting period. This is simply a request for the board to make the determination that the zoning administrator erred in canceling this owner this um, permit due to an ownership change. If the board determines that the zoning administrator made a mistake, erred, or arbitrarily canceled this permit, then the permit would just be reinstated. It would just overturn the zoning administrator's decision. Okay. All right. So we'll hear from the applicant. Hello, my name is Carlos Gaskin. I'm, I'm here with my wife, Cheryl Gaskin. Um, in early January of 2020, my wife and I went to our state attorney and he advised us to put this particular condo in a trust with my wife and I as sole trustees. We did that and we, uh, we submitted a general warranty deed to Davidson County, deeding our interest to our revocable trust with the two of us remaining sole trustees. This was recorded in Davidson County on January 13, 2020. Fast forward this to early March of 2020, we sent in a uh, short-term rental permit renewal affidavit, even though it did not expire until July of 2020. Notwithstanding why he had, okay, I asked my wife if the $313 check had cleared and she told me it had not. I kept asking her that for about a week. Notwithstanding why it had not cleared at that length of time, I went to the STRP open portal to make sure it had been delivered and to my surprise, our permit was canceled. 
On March 16th, they tried to contact the Coast Department, but had no success. So on March 19th, we got in our car in Tallahassee, Florida, drove eight and a half hours up here. And we're lucky enough to get a, uh, an appointment on March 20th with Mr. Frabut. I don't have to know. Frabut. What? Frabut. Frabut, okay. When we met with Mr. Frabut, he pulled up a, a permit status for us. And at that time, we were told that the reason for cancellation was that we had created a revocable trust for Unit 407. And that meant the change in ownership. He, he also pulled up the letter that was being mailed to us, but we had not received it yet. Uh, we received it about three days after we got back home. At that point, where we have it? Okay, after meeting with Mr. Frabert on March 20th, we immediately unlisted this property and requested to appeal this decision. We have not engaged in rental of the units since signing out about the permit cancellation. So, and, and I, uh, I appreciate all that, and, and it sounds like you're trying to do the right thing. And, you know, the, the question that we have, and this is not the first case that we've heard where someone has, has done um, what you've done. I, I, I don't recall if, if it's uh, if every case we've heard was a revocable trust um, or an irrevocable trust, but we've got enough attorneys on our board to deal with these types of things to to help me understand whether this is a, a legitimately a, a change of ownership. And so, I guess our question at hand is, you know, did the did the zoning administrator err by? Um, determining that you had changed the ownership of your property when you went from your personal ownership to the trust ownership. And if the zoning administrator didn't care, if that happened, then we were told today that you could, you know, go ahead and, and reapply for a, a permit. But if, you know, if you're arguing that this wasn't a change in ownership, then, then we need to hear that case. No, I'm not. Uh, shoot, I'm not arguing that at all. Uh, and, and I would just point out for the board and for the appellants, this property they could reapply under the trust. This is um, this zoning district does allow non-owner occupied, so they can reapply. Um, but they chose to appeal the cancellation. Okay, Mr. Lawless, did you have a question? Just, just to ask the applicant, did you use it? Tennessee lawyer or a Florida lawyer or the revocable I trust? Used a, I used a Florida lawyer, and yeah. then after I got this letter, I called him. I said, what is this now? Is this is, is, a, is a revocable trust a uh, change in ownership? He says, no. Not in Florida, it's not, because IRS doesn't even count it as a change of ownership. If you have a revocable trust, then where the two original owners are the sole trustees. And we are the sole trustees here. I, I, I understand. Being a native Floridian, they ought to stay down in Florida and let us do our <laughs> stuff up here with all due respect, sir. But I'll leave that for you to talk okay. to your lawyer. Uh, okay. Hey, are there any other questions for the applicant at this time? All right, sir, did you have anything to add at this point? No, I did not, sir. And I believe that there was opposition, so we can hear from the opposition, and then uh, Mr. Gaskin, you can, I'll have to, I'm sorry, Emily, did you have something? No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, so, uh, so we'll hear from the opposition, and then uh, Mr. Gaskin will have uh, whatever time's left to address um, the opposition, and then we'll go from there. And before the opposition speaks, I would make a note for the board. I received word that Com Councilman Freddie O'Connell is vehemently opposed to this particular application. I did, he didn't give me more specifics than that, but I, that is the word that I have received. Okay. And again, I, the, uh, just to remind everybody that the only issue we have here is did the ownership change? Um, it's not necessarily whether or not this applicant is eligible to um, have a short-term rental in this property because that's determined by a different 
uh, a different, that's that's the law. Hey, Miki either is or is not eligible for that, but our test today is to determine it was the zoning uh, administrator correct and saying that there was an ownership change. So let's hear from the opposition. If they're not in the mic now, please hear the mic. Yes, well, this is Scott Tyrone, 23 Music Square East. Um, it's not necessarily opposition to, I forget, Ms. Caskill. Yes. And on, the, on the technicality, <clears throat> that seems to be something I can work through. My biggest thing is, this is Spence Manor, and it is a sick, I have a difficult time hearing, hearing the, the witness, please. This, oh, sorry. This is this probably is known as Spence Manor, and it's a six-story property on top of a podium garage. And there are roughly 44 units in there. And with this application that's in question today, that brings 37 short-term rentals in there. And the reason I bring that up is we have the property in the same block, and we renovated it. And a year ago, asked for 12 out of 14 permits, and the code department determined that we were a change of use. And we were no longer in compliance. Basically, we had to sprinkle it. And we lost an appeal, then lost the historical re uh, renovation appeal. Wound up having to sprinkle it. My only, my only comment is that Spence Manor, 86% of them are short term rentals. It's, it's not the problem, except it's just a double standard. That property's not sprinkled. And I just want to bring it to the attention. It has nothing to do with the matter at hand at all. Just when I got the notification, I was kind of like, hmm. Well, we had to do it. I'm not why didn't everybody else have to do it on a multifamily property. Okay. All right. So thank you. Um, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. And, and anything else? And we'll hear, appreciate you coming out, uh, hear from the applicant again. Okay. I'm here. All we're wanting is to be able to reapply for uh, our permit in the trust name. And I will, I, you, if the board um, determines that the zoning administrator erred, your permit would be automatically reinstated. If they determine that we did not make a mistake, then you can reapply. Okay. Uh, and assuming you meet all the eligibility requirements, you can, you would get your permit. Okay, that's fine. And, and, and would be able, to be able to apply immediately, right? I mean, the, we just correct the permit was correct. canceled and then you, you could apply and, and and assuming you've done everything you were supposed to which you testified that you have then that's between you and the codes department not us um correct be able to apply again immediately all right mr lawless did you have a question it's not necessarily a question i'm going to wait for the applicant to finish and then i'm going to make a motion unless miss davis wants to make one i'll <laughs> hurt her every time believe me all right. Um, all right, Mr. Gaskin, did, did you have anything else? No, I did not. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank all you. right, thank you. Um, then we'll close the public hearing. And Mr. Lawless? I'm going to make a motion that uh, the zoning administrator was correct, that the uh, denial of the per or the withdrawal of the permit was correct, and that uh, uh, that we should move forward from there. I'll second that motion. This is Mr. Pepper. I have a motion and have a second. Um, and yeah, it's a really unfortunate situation um, since the laws in Florida are different in that regard than Tennessee, but uh, glad that the applicant will have the ability to, to reapply for the permit. Uh, if this motion passes, we'll um, ask for a vote unless there's any comments or discussion. Seeing none, Mr. Lawless? Aye. Mr. Pepper? Aye. Mr. Newton? Aye. Or, uh, Ms. Karpenick? In favor. Uh, Ms. Davis? In favor. And I vote in favor also. Uh, that motion passes, and we'll hear our last case. Last case is 2021-22 involving property at 3001 Stafford Drive. This is another appeal of a cancellation due to a change in ownership. Mr. McBroom is here on behalf of staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 122? Seeing none, after Mr. McBroom addresses the board, the applicant will have five minutes to make the presentation.
This is an owner-occupied permit. The permit was issued on March 22nd of 18 and renewed in 2019. On 5-16-19, the ownership changed from Arthur and Katrina Wood to the Wood Family Revocable Living Trust. 3-24-2020 cancellation letter was sent. On April the 3rd, 2020, the BZA appeal was filed. There were 264 total documents days, 116 of which occurred after the cancellation, or uh, the ownership change. The cancellation letter was sent in late March, and there was one documented stay in April, which was the last documented stay. The uh, two website ads remain posted. The Airbnb ad calendar has the month of May and June block, but may be booked after that. The home away ad appears to be able to be booked by submitting the requested date and then receiving an email to complete the booking. There have been no documented complaints and no other actions were taken. <clears throat> there is a concern on this property though. This is not before you, but this was an owner occupied permit. However, based upon the new address of the, after the ownership change, which is 4453 Mejia Avenue, Sherman Oaks, California, the possibility exists that the Woods do not live in Nashville. That's not before you today, but that's just for the record. All right, so that you said this this is owned by the, the Wood family? That's correct, uh, Wood family trust at this point. Okay. Ma'am, you have address the board. Uh, hello, Lindsay Lee's 3001 Stafford Drive. I'm the daughter of Katrina Wood. My mother and I reside at Stafford Drive. My name was initially not on um, any of the ownership papers that has since been changed. Um, I am the, uh, I run the short-term rental permit that has nothing to do with Katrina Wood. She is unaware of how the short-term rental permit operates. Um, that is fully under my control, however, I was unaware that she had moved the properties into a trust and was not informed by Metro at the time of May 19 that the permit had then been voided. Um, it wasn't until I went to reapply for the permit in March that I was informed that um, due to the movement of ownership that the permit had been voided. And um, so I'm here asking for leniency in hopes to have the permit reinstated because the house has been moved um, out of ownership of the trust and in, back into a single ownership. And um, can I add to that? There was no malintent. No, the, the, the issue was that um, we didn't realize when it said trust that it had to do with a revocable trust that we had. And uh, as soon as there was an issue, we, um, I moved it immediately. I did it to protect my child. I, and we moved it back immediately into individual names. Didn't realize that that was an issue. And uh, I live in Tennessee with my daughter and the uh, property is in the names per the law required by the state of Tennessee. And um, so it's in individual's names now. We did that as soon as we heard there was an issue. And have so, provided proof of that. Yep, and we sent in the notarized documents, and we have a council check from uh, Davidson County. Um, and so we complied immediately. There was no malintent or uh, anything like that we didn't realize. And so, so ma'am, could, could, you, you ma could you state your name and address for the record, please? Katrina Wood, 3001 Stafford Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37214. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I would just note for the board, this is similar to the last case in that the appeal is whether or not our cancellation of the permit due to the ownership change was an error. If you determine that it was an error, the permit would be reinstated immediately. If you determine that it was not an error, they can reapply. They, this is an owner-occupied permit, so they can, and because it has, an owner-occupied permit has to be in the uh, hands of a natural and natural person, but because it has transferred back to a person, they can reapply for this owner occupied permit. Okay. All right. And and did did you all understand that from the from the last case? Yes, 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 sir. Okay. Yes. 
So, I mean, it, it, it sounds to me like that, I mean, our determination is, is whether or not the zoning administrator was correct in saying that there was a change of ownership. And it sounds like from what your testimony was just now that you actually did change the ownership to the trust, then you changed it back. So they're, they're, I'm hearing you say there actually was a change of ownership. Is that correct? There was a change of ownership. Yeah, uh, at the at the time, the idea was to was for reasons of protection because I I was uh, diagnosed with heart disease, so I wanted to do something quickly to protect my child. Once we realized that was an error, uh, we moved very quickly to rectify that and and took it out and put it back in the individual name. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, it's been a hard, it has been a hardship. Um, if, if you you know just to address that, especially during this pandemic, it's been pretty stressful. So uh, you know to give us permission to go back and get the permit um, without a wait would be you know really appreciated. Okay, all right. Uh, any any other questions from the board, Mr. Lawless? Okay, I, I'm I'm just looking at the quit claim deed going back from the trust into the individuals and you've added a, a new owner, um, as I understand it, uh, Ms. Lees is on there, yeah. is that correct? Okay. And is there any is there any question that you transfer for whatever reason from uh, the woods to the trust? Does that the reason was for protection I, of my child because I well, had a I had a diagnosis. Which I know, ma'am. Ma'am, I understand that. I've 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 got a similar reason, and I'm uh, for doing things too. But I'm just okay. trying to confirm. You did transfer it from the individuals, yes. you and your husband, to the trust itself. Yes. Okay, and then it went from the trust back to live yeah, yeah. breathing people yeah. okay i'm just i'm yes, just sir. clarifying a record for for our purposes and and i think the chairman will do a good job of explaining why what's getting ready to happen is going to happen all right okay did you all have anything else to add not at this time do you okay great um uh, then i'll close the public hearing and this case again appears to be exactly the same as the last case which means that based on the evidence, uh, in my opinion, uh, that the zoning administrator did not err, that, that there was a, a transfer of the property, um, but because of the the circumstances that were stated today, um, if we determine that, the applicant is certainly eligible to apply um, soon, is that right, em Emily? There's no, there's nothing that would cause them to... That's correct. So they, all right, so they, they would be able to apply uh, pretty much immediately. Um, well, not immediately since it's after five, but, <laughs> but, but as, as soon as soon as they choose to apply, they can. So, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err and there is there was a change of ownership. Mr. Lawless, I'll second your motion. I have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion? And uh, we'll take a vote, Mr. Lawless. In favor. In uh, favor. Ms. In favor. Ms. Carpenter. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. Mr. Pepper. In favor. I'll vote in favor also. And so uh, that motion passes and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. See you later. All right. Good luck to all. Be good and safe. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.